Good evening, everyone. I'm Jen Wallison, Mayor of Menlo Park, and welcome to the City Council's April 25th regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. Please note that public comment speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers for each item. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor, City Council members Drew Combs, Maria Dorr, and Betsy Nash. Um, and I do wanna note that City Council Maria Dorr is participating remotely under Assembly Bill 2449, Just Cause. City Council Member Dorr, can you please provide a general description of the circumstances related to the use of AB 2449, Just Cause? Yes, thank you. I'm utilizing AB 2449 Just Cause because of a contagious illness that prevents me from attending in person. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorr, and we wish you a quick recovery. Um, staff present tonight include our City Manager, Justin Murphy, our City Attorney, Nira Doherty, who's participating remotely, and our City Clerk, Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the city council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. And again, echoing a welcome to our regular April 25th city council meeting for members of the public who are here to provide comment on any of our agenda items. If you are participating in person, we ask that you fill out a speaker card at that back table and bring it up here to the clerk's desk. For those of you participating virtually, after the mayor calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press a star nine at that time. And that concludes my introductions. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We're moving on to agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order or any requests from city council members under city council member reports. Does any member of the city council wish to pull or modify an agenda item? Council member Nash. Thank you. I would like to pull uh, I-5. Are there any other council member requests on agenda items? I'm, oh, yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. I'd like to pull I-4. I-4. Anyone else? Okay, so we will be pulling I-4, which is to receive and file the single audit for the fiscal year ended thir June 30th, 2022. And I-5 authorized the city manager to execute agreements with Sloan Sakai and Liebert Kasumi Whitmore for legal services related to human resources. At uh, this time, I would like to introduce City Attorney Doherty. We're moving on to D, the report out from closed session. Uh, city Attorney Doherty, um, is there any reportable action from the April 18th closed session? Thank you, Madam Mayor. There is no reportable action. Thank you, City Attorney Doherty. We are now moving on to E, public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the City Council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the City Council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The City Council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the City Council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment at the appropriate times for a member of the public to address the City Council on the items under the various agenda sections. Those will include presentations and proclamations, advisory body vacancies and appointments, study session, consent calendar, public hearing, regular business, and informational items. So again, at this time, this is for general public comment. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for that? Yes, thank you, Mayor Wollison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item E for items not on the agenda, if you are, if you are participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. 
If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine now. Um, Mayor Willison, we have approximately 10 speakers at the moment. Uh, we can go ahead with the usual public comment time. Thank you. So our first speaker will be Aliyah in person. Hi, my name is Ala Lee and I'm with Youth Leadership Institute and our, or, and our organization is a member of the San Mateo County Tobacco Education Coalition. We wanna thank the council for their consideration of a smoke-free multi-unit housing ordinance during their priority setting workshop. And we want to let you know that as part of our work, we're listening to concerns of community members about equitable enforcement policies, and we're focused on housing first approach. We will be doing outreach to listen to resident concerns and provide an opportunity to answer questions about how a smoke free multi unit housing ordinance could work. We will continue to update the Council on our progress and we look forward to engaging with the Menlo Park community. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Patrick Kalia. Hi, thanks for the time. I'm a 25 year uh, Menlo Park resident. Can you please move the microphone a little closer? Sure. Listen. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are several large signs at the public library recommending that patrons wear masks. Instead, there should be warning signs about the dangers of wearing masks. Uh, masks were never about safety. It was known from the beginning of the pandemic. They could not possibly work against an aerosolized virus, one which is not spread by droplets. It's the virus itself in the air. The particles are so small that any mask capable of filtering out these viruses would be impossible to breathe through. So masks have become a badge of political identity, a, a badge worn at the expense of one's health, and they're not something the library should be promoting. Uh, masks create little personal climate change spaces of dangerously elevated carbon dioxide. A study in the journal Cell explains that fresh air has around 0.04% CO2, while wearing a mask causes chronic exposure to carbon dioxide levels 35 to 80 times as much. U.S. Navy toxicity experts set the CO2 exposure limits for submarines carrying female crew much lower than the level you get wearing a mask based on studies, which show an increased risk of stillbirth, birth defects, and irreversible offspring neuron damage um, when you're breathing uh, at the mask CO2 level, not to mention the increased anxiety and impaired learning and memory in adults who wear masks. Then there's the well-known retardation in learning among children who are trying to learn to speak when wearing a mask or trying to understand people who are wearing masks. Um, Dr. Fauci knew that masks would not help in the slightest, and he admitted that at first, but eventually he realized that masks work very well at instilling fear, both through the visual aspect and through the anxiety caused by increased carbon dioxide. Uh, the state of emergency is officially over, so how long do we plan to keep trying to instill fear? Forever? Um, and is the city prepared for lawsuits, which could happen as a result of dangerously bad advice given in prominent signs to the public? So I'm asking that those signs be removed from the library. Um, ideally, signs pointing out the harms of masks would, would protect the public, but I don't expect that much. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Millie. Hi, my name is Millie. I'm, I'm born and raised um, from East Palo Alto, but I also... The microphone. Okay. <laughs> and for those members of the public, if you do come up to the podium, the microphone is flexible because I know there's people of different heights. So just put it near your mouth. Thank you. So I was saying I was born and raised in East Palo Alto and grew up in Menlo Park. My grandmother lived there for decades. And I remember um, going to the Oneta 
community center um, to socialize and hang with my friends and also to swim there. And I just wanted to say that Facebook has already taken over East Menlo Park. Um, it's I, We look at it as like a bird land, like everywhere it's Facebook. And I just don't want you guys to take away the Oneta Community Center, the name, the name. So this is regarded the name continuance for the Oneta Community Center. We have a lot of people um, here today and also online that are in support of the name continuance. And I hope that you guys will really take consideration to continue the name and not have them change it. Um, thanks, that's all. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Herbert Barkas. My name is Herbert Barkas. I was a resident of East Palo Alto. I was here when we had the Murdoch Capital in East Palo Alto. I actually worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations in East Palo Alto to stop the violence in East Palo Alto when we had the Murdoch Capital. I was about 21. I'm right now 50 years old right now. Married with a wife. I have my business. I'm a promoter. I promote all the time on social media. I have a lot of support companies. Um, I'm against what Facebook the, is doing by taking names that used to be in East Palo Alto and Menlo Park. Whatever that stays there should stay there. It should not be changed. So what I would do is with my job as a promoter and as a big person in this community, um, I'm, I will fight to the day I die. When, when God takes me home, I will fight like I did before. I did it before. I'll do it again. Um, to shut down whatever is not right and also shut down because I just moved to Miller Park right now. I rent in Miller Park right now, and I did not know that you guys do the uh, parking thing at 2 o'clock a.m. to 5 p.m. I pay a lot of freaking money for the place I stay with with my wife, okay? So that need to be shut down, and whatever I got to do, I will shut it down because it don't make sense. You know, my car is illegal. Everything is illegal on my car. And you threaten to put tags, the stickers on, I mean, pay, do like, um, what you call it? Uh, uh, put tickets on my car to pay for that. Then if I don't pay for that, then you're gonna tow my car. That's a fat ass lawsuit, excuse my language. I will fight and I'm not joking because all I got is God. And when I speak, a lot of people back here know who I am. Check the background check on me. That's straight up, okay? All right. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Candace Butler, followed by Jennifer Ferrier. Good evening. I'm Candace Butler. I'm a native of Menlo Park, and my family grew up here in Menlo Park as well. And I'm here about the Oneta Harris um, Community Center name change. Um, this community center was and is impactful, even if it wasn't so obvious while I was attending. This place was a, was a safe house and represented a sense of community for all the youth in this neighborhood from the directors to the staff and just the way they involved the community was and is important. I remember daily walking to OHCC, knowing that I was gonna have this space to complete my homework and ask for help if I ever need it. I can hang out with my friends in a protected environment and feel at home. This same place was also a haven for my parents, my father specifically, he joined the basketball team and this was also a haven for him and his friends to be. Summers, we would all go to the swimming pool because it was only the only place in town you can get to since no one actually owns a swimming pool in East Menlo Park. Um, actually learned to swim there. I've always known the Harris family and am friends with Oneta Harris's grandchildren. Their care for the community and preserving Mrs. Harris's legacy means so much to me and really to the others that I've grown up with. Menlo Park has changed so much over the years, and the least y'all can do is keep the community names that made history and paved ways for this city. Why throw it away? I just don't find it necessary to change history and erase a public figure of our community when they have done nothing but add to the community. If Meta 
was sincere about its intentions in Menlo Park, it would try not to it would try not to wipe away what was already here, but would instead be in support of. They have already dispersed themselves throughout the town. Allow the youth a chance to know and or learn about the people that have truly made a difference in Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Jennifer and I heard <laughs> that I might have pronounced the last name wrong, apologies. Fairly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's L-E-Y, Fairly. Perfect. Hi, also Jennifer Fairly. I was also born and raised in Menlo Park, um, right around the corner from Oneida Harris Community Center. Um, I also would like to stand on keeping the name. That is the name that obviously, you know, we know and love and grew to love. Um, that was one place we were able to go to and experience childhood friends, safe place for us all. Um, it was also a place where it literally kind of paved the way for my adulthood. I was, able, I was on the basketball team there, um, swim there, literally did everything there because that was the only place we had to go. So that's literally my history. And again, we don't want our history erased because that's our history. That's what we know. And we would love for you guys, or excuse me, those others that's trying to, you know, be a part of Menlo Park to also know that history instead of erasing it and or rewriting it. So again, we're just pretty much, let's keep it the way it is. It's never changed. It's, gave, it's given us plenty of life. We've have more kids to come and grow up through there also in Oneta Harris Community Center in East Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Oneta Harris followed by Lynn Dan Doe. Um, I do just want to uh, comment that uh, while we appreciate a lot of feelings and enthusiasm here in council chambers, um, we tend not to clap or jeer or make um, audible responses. Um, we, we know that a lot of people here are enthusiastic, but we just ask that you respect um, council decorum. So thank you. All right. Hello. Um, Good afternoon or good evening, I should say. My name is Onetta Harris. I'm here representing the We Are Onetta Harris group and really just want to say we want to keep the name the same. Um, name continuance is huge for us, understanding that a lot of new people have come into the community, but it feels like as those new people have come into the community, organizations and efforts, a lot of the culture is being taken away. And um, unfortunately, that's, that's really... Um, I feel like it's almost like a slap in the face of the community for the people that have been there, have grown up. Um, a lot of us have maybe moved out of the area, but Oneta Harris Community Center is a place that all of us go when we come back into town just to reminisce. Um, I've met so many lifelong friends there um, and really started a great foundation there from swimming, learning how to play basketball, learning about teamwork, life skills, many mentors at the Oneta Harris Community Center um, that I'm still in contact with, but that um, created a great foundation for so many kids going back generation upon generation. And um, just really wanna say that um, changing the name or the even the converse, let's take a step back. When we first um, were introduced to um, this gift from Meta to the community, there was um, essentially you, all or Meta even mentioned that there was no interest in the name change. And now that we're here a couple of years later, understand that things have shifted and the people who were working on that committee that said that they weren't interested, that that conversation has changed and just is really not understanding why we're backpedaling on something that we said we had no interest on. Um, so at the end of the day, we just love to say, let's keep the name the same. Let's keep the community, the culture the same. Let's not um, erase what a, a figure that has been a pillar in the community. Um, I did not get a chance to meet my grandmother, unfortunately, but I'm constantly hearing stories about how she uplifted people, how she inspired people, and how she was essentially a second mother to so many people in the community. Um, and just to know that that nostalgia, that that cultural um, presence is so strong and still to this very day in the East Menlo Park, area would love to keep it the same and hope that you guys do the right thing here. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Lynn Dando, followed by Kelly Kirby. 
Good evening, Mayor Olison and City Council members. My name is Lynn Dando. I'm a Menlo Park resident. I serve on the Planning Commission. I'm speaking for myself. And first of all, I just want to say wow to all my, the previous speakers. Um, I'm learning a lot about this community to which I'm fairly um, new. Hundreds, actually over a thousand community members attended the Love Our Earth Festival at MA High School on Saturday, an event that was a success thanks to a collaboration of organizations and cities, including Menlo Park. Thank you. However, the success of the event and in contrast, the recent disruptive winter storms are actually both in their own ways, clear signs that we need urgent action now. Menlo Park declared a climate emergency four years ago in 2019, adopted a climate action plan in 2020, and the city has an all electric reach code for new buildings. However, this is not enough. We need to do more. I'm asking you to provide an update to the community on progress and where we are with implementing the climate action plan. And along with over 150 community members who signed the petition, a healthy climate starts at home. I'm asking you for a commitment to bring at least one or more significant climate measures for this year, preferably equitable electrification of existing buildings, and that these measures incorporate broad community outreach and education, as well as adaptation and resilience support for those who are disproportionately impacted by the impacts of climate change. Um, it's really looking forward to Menlo Park being a leader in creating a livable future for um, our community and our kids. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So Kelly Kirby, followed by Chester Paliso. Hello, my name is Kelly Kirby, and I'm here to express my support of the Oneta Harris Community Center. Mrs. Harris's legacy, her beloved family, friends, and neighbors. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and child health advocate. I'm committed to protecting the health, well being, and happiness of my young patients. I urge you to please maintain the name Oneta Harris Community Center. For the children of Belhaven and East Menlo Park, a trusted and recognized name means everything. It breaks down barriers and opens doors. It communicates that all are welcome. Equitable access to the benefits at a community center, such as a safe space for social interaction with peers and senior members of the community, after school enrichment activities, play and physical fitness, healthy food and water are essential. I ask you to kindly please continue to honor Ms. Harris and her many contributions by ensuring that the community center remains in her name and is proudly displayed for all children and families to see. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next is Chester Polisu, followed by Diane Bailey. Check, we're on. <laughs> Greetings, Madam Mayor, honorary members of the uh, council, as well as wonderful administrative staff. Thank you for the opportunity. I am here to strongly support the Oneta Harris Community Center and continuation of their by name because it's the legacy of our Bellhaven community. That's what we need to have in place. It's legendary, historically within Menlo Park in the Eastern part of Menlo Park. Let me specifically specify that. Because anybody that walks in Belhaven or Eastern part of the freeway 101, you say that name, they know who, exactly who you're talking about. I'm going to tell you, when I was at uh, OICW, now they changed the job train, the name changes and what have you. What happened is that uh, I was running the uh, youth program called the SASE throughout the Sequoia High School District. When I was working closely with Ms. Harris, I call her Ms. Harris, that's <laughs> still called Ms. Harris, is the fact that she was a person with the legacy and know-how type of leadership skills to make things to happen, to help the youngsters develop within themselves and throughout the communities at large. Some of those youngsters were able to move on colleges and become successful. In fact, OICW has been in business many, many years. I um, you're able to engage with uh, Paul Cook. I'm sure you guys know Paul Cook is the CEO of Ray Camp was right there. Before he went out of business, 
You know, when I run into Paul, when it comes to the board meetings at OSCW, job training, is the fact that we kind of touch with both veterans. I am here in support on behalf of the veterans and Asian Pacific Islander leaders. That's why I'm here, as we're presenting those two groups. Thereby, it's interesting that we need to change the name just because of what we socially, you know, out in the air, in our environment. But we need to look at really what is best for our communities at large, throughout our communities. We need to keep that continuation of the Oneta Harris Community Center name changes should not be in place. In other words, let's maintain and retain the Oneta Harris where it is and continue to have that legacy in place to historically maintain our community as how it is then, now, and forevermore. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you consider maintaining that name without any changes, just because you have new companies that are moving in with you know, whatever they're trying to sell you. We need to look at what's best for the community at large is what we need to consider strongly and keep that name without name changes of any kind or any type. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Diane Bailey, followed by Ken Harris. Good evening, Mayor Wollison and council members. My name is Diane Bailey. I'm with Menlo Spark, a community group supporting a swift transition to a zero carbon clean energy economy in Menlo Park. I wanted to thank the city for supporting the Love Our Earth Festival last weekend. It was a fantastic event and very well attended as well. Um, thank you to Mayor Wollison, council members and staff who participated, and also to the local leaders who organized the event. It's very clear that there's so much support for climate and sustainability in this community, and Menlo Park has a long history of being a leader on climate, adopting a REACH code and declaring a climate emergency in 2019, and updating the Climate Action Plan in 2020 to be the strongest in California at that time. It seems that our momentum on climate measures has slowed down just a bit. Although we have felt the impacts of climate already with extreme storms this past winter, and we know that action is needed. I hope the city will continue its leadership on climate. One thing that would be extremely helpful would be a public update on the status of the climate action plan and what's slated for this year. More importantly, we'd really like to see a commitment to bring at least one or more significant climate measures forward this year. Electrification would provide the greatest benefits and has a lot of support in the community, as Lynn Dando talked about earlier. Other climate measures would be helpful as well, especially focusing on health, air quality, and resilience co-benefits, and investing more in Belhaven. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Ken Harris, followed by Raquel Harris. Good afternoon. How are y'all doing? Good afternoon. Please uh, bring the microphone closer. Thank you so yeah, much. I'm Kenneth Harris, and I want to speak to the Oneta Harris Community Center, continuous of the naming process, continuous of the name. And I have, uh, I like to talk about uh, economic currency versus uh, social currency. You know, as a business owner, I started my, my business from a mustard seed. And it grew. And the economic currency was one thing, but the social currency is what carried the business. In other words, when, when a person does something in the interest of the community or the patronage of the community, that is what this is all about. The great prophets, the great leaders, all of them had a social tie more than an economic tie. I'm not saying that the economic is, is not important, but the, the social tie is what's really important. Businesses can come, businesses can go. But names, especially names that we all appreciate and love, names remain. So a business can go out of business, but that name, if that name is significant, 
and you guys have these naming criteria, uh, items one and two, speak about compelling and significant contributions to, to the community. And with great reluctance, with great reluctance, you all will change the name. But the point is you will not change the name, uh, especially in a case like this. I think a case like this where people walk in, they're familiar, they're comfortable, they know what the history is. I think it means a lot to the public. Ray Kim goes, Sun goes, those businesses go. What if something happens? All business can go. Then you keep this name uh, Meta. What happens then after that? So we, we have to think forward and ahead. And names, names again, remain. They're everlasting. Oneta meets every criteria that you have in terms of your significant and compelling reasons for keeping that name intact. And I think that this would be in the best interest for social currency reasons. I'm talking about social currency, not economic. And I'd just like for you all to really think about social currency. I know economic currency is important, but social currency is what we really need for the continuance of the Oneta Harris Community Center's name. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next is Raquel Harris, followed by Rona Harris. Good evening, my name is Raquel Harris. Um, my son is a fourth grader at Beachwood. One of the main reasons why we went to Beachwood is because of the activities that he would be involved in at Onetta Harris Community Center. Like many, I had many firsts at Onetta Harris. It was my first job. I learned to cook, learned a lot of life skills, played basketball. Anything you can think of, I did it at Onetta Harris. Um, I want my son, all children, my other son, David, will be going to Beachwood in a couple of years. I think that it's important. Representation matters. They need to see that they are able, they can do things. And someone that looks just like them, who happens to be a relative, has accomplished so much. And I've, I'm, I'm excited for everything that's soon to come. I think that is great, the activities that are going to be coming. But I also think that I want our kids to be able to enjoy it. I want them, I went there as an adult, and I wasn't able to get through Onetta Harris as I was as a, as a kid. You were able to go from the computer room to the activity room to play basketball. As an adult, you weren't able to do that. When I returned to work for the city of Menlo Park as an adult, I had to assign people to go to each room and keep track, which yes, for safety purposes, that is a good thing. But at the same time, it limits everyone in what they can do. I'm asking that this representation of my grandmother, Onetta Harris, while I never knew her, I worked as a community health advocate at Ravenswood. And when people would see my last name, I heard so many stories as a, as a kid to an adult. And I want things to stay the, same, stay the same. I would love for my children to have the same experiences I did. My son plays basketball, they play football. I want for them to experience the same way I did. So I'm asking that you guys, please, please consider this. Representation matters for all kids across the board so that they see that you know, they can do, they are able. There is someone that looks like them. There's art that came from their peers or from them. And my son will be one of the first to tour the Onetta Harris is, is what I'm hearing. Um, once it's available, he'll be able to do the activities from a fourth grader up to a teen. I'm excited. I was a teen there as well. So I'm just asking for everything to remain the same. I'm asking that you consider that and Thank you for everything. Thank you for the the, the changing and, and bringing everything in. We appreciate it. But in the same breath, representation matters. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Rona Harris, followed by John McKenna. Good evening, Mayor Wilson. Uh, city council and staff. History matters. Legacy matters. Keeping the name Onetta Harris Community Center matters. Question is, why was the name changed during the interim? I don't know. I know you won't answer, but that's one of my questions. 
Um, prior to the, demoli the demolition, several items were offered to the residents, items no longer needed for the new building. Among those items was a large picture of Mrs. Onetta Harris. When asked the personnel who was offering these items, who is this, you know, what is this picture for? And the person said, I don't know who that is. And I think history matters. I think that if you're offering items from the center, I'm sorry, I don't do a lot of public speaking, so I'm trying to do my best. But this really struck me. I feel that if you are offering these items to the community and you don't know who this large picture of the person this, this park was named, of, named after, and it was a unanimous vote by the city council, someone should know the history, okay? What makes a unanimous vote by a prior city council prior, um, possibly to be voided at this point? Big companies come and go. And I really hope that you consider keeping the name Onetta Harris Community Center. It's not about me, it's not about us, but it's about the whole community. People who have been there before, people who still come, would like to come, want to feel welcome. And we have, there's been a lot of great programs there. I'm sorry, I'm being emotional. But it's very close and dear to my heart. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be John McKenna, followed by Agnes Harris. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Honorable Mayor Wilson, fellow council members and city staff, my name is John McKenna. I serve on the Environmental Quality Commission, but I am commenting tonight as an individual. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for all your great work on behalf of the city of Menlo Park. First of all, I just wanna say, I really appreciate all the comments from the Bellhaven community. And I sincerely hope that the city will respect their wishes. Saturday was Earth Day and many of us celebrated at the Love Our Earth Festival. The event had something for everyone and was an opportunity for our communities to come together and learn ways that we can all be greener citizens. In the spirit of Earth Day, I'm urging the city of Menlo Park to accelerate progress on the climate action plan. While we are moving in the right direction, the pace must quicken. The most recent IPCC report, which was finalized last month, noted with very high confidence that climate change is a threat to human well being and planetary health. And there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. I highlight this not to instill fear, but to inspire action. I maintain hope for our future, but hope can only be sustained through action. My hope comes from knowing that we have so many solutions at our disposal and that individuals and organizations all over the world are working towards implementing these solutions while continuing to develop new technologies. This is an all hands on deck moment and local action is critical to making progress. I respectfully ask that Menlo Park prioritize both climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. I acknowledge that there are many important issues facing the city and that addressing climate change will not be easy, but we have the tools and numerous rebates and tax incentives are in place to allow for an equitable transition to a decarbonized future for all. We owe it to our children and future generations to do everything within our power to address this situation with the urgency that it demands and deserves. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Agnes Harris, followed by Sheena Marie Castro. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Hi there, 
this is Agnes Harris, and I am the granddaughter of Onetta Harris. And I remember when the name change was made, I, we had um, pretty much moved to Southern California. But I understand and I've read that it was her name, Onetta M. Harris, was one posthumously um, changed the, the, to the name, well, the park was changed to her name posthumously or posthumous, however you pronounce it. Um, but what I haven't really uh, spoken about or heard spoken about was how outstanding and upstanding she was to have been awarded that name change. Um, she represented community activism and organization. She cared dearly and deeply about her community. She cared dearly and deeply about everyone that resided in the community and demonstrated that daily. I come from a very educated family on her side, my father's side. All of her children were educated. I graduated from UCLA. I attended Berkeley before that, and I was skipped. So I was young when I did it. And the point I'm making is, is that she, I did that because of her. My grandmother was a beautiful woman and a very caring and a compassionate woman and represented a pillar in the community. So I am calling in because the name should not be changed. It shouldn't even be up for debate. I remember when the name was changed. I remember how the park changed. It became more beautiful. And that was basically due to the presence of her name at that park. Her name represented it unity and it represented progress and it represented, it represented care and concern about the people and the well being of Menlo Park and East Palo Alto. Her limit was not just to Menlo Park. But I'm saying all of this because it's now 40 years later. And I don't know what the criteria for a name change are or why, but her energy still resides and remains in the community. And it is empowering to that community, that area and beyond that. And those transformations that happened after she passed, the, her name, the park being changed to Annette M. Harris demonstrates her presence and her essence beyond her death. Anybody that speaks about my grandmother speaks about her with just pure happiness and joy and trust. So the name needs to remain Onetta Harris Community Center. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Sheena Marie Castro, followed by Jayante Day. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Sheena Marie Castro, and I worked for Menlo Park for about 10 years. Um, and I actually recently resigned, and my last day was on the 14th. Um, so instead of in filling out the exit interview form, I ended up sending an email out uh, to basically everybody in the city. Um, so I just wanted to read that to you all. Um, also, I believe in the audience or in uh, the Zoom call, you do have uh, Angel Pigon, who is the SA SEIU 521 uh, representative for us. Um, just wanted to let you guys know that we're, we're kind of all listening in. Um, but here's the email. Uh, Good afternoon, Menlo Parkians. As some of you may know, this is my last day with the city. And to sum it all up, it has been a decade of a ride. Putting my final thoughts on an exit interview form where it would probably get tucked away into a file, physical or electronic, just does not sit right with me. So here it is. For some short and sweet background, I started off with Menlo Park at the Environmental Programs Division, which is now known as Sustainability, um, uh, within the Public Works Department, which later was then moved to the City Manager's Department, um, working on the first set of EV chargers within the Burgess parking lot and downtown parking lots, the project reignited my environmental science itch for green building um, I had in my college years. Thus my move to the building division's permit tech team, but then with the goal and intent of becoming a building inspector, which I was able to achieve. Um, along this path, I became curious about the union and labor negotiations. 
uh, having the opportunity to participate in two previous labor negotiations between SEIU 521 and City, and now sitting as uh, the SEIU chair, uh, or at least previously was. I believe I've gained enough uh, knowledge and understanding of how Menlo Park works and then local government. Uh, as I mentioned in the last just-in-time meeting, I can see the effort and vision coming to fruition in the city manager's office with outdoor dining, electrification of housing and commercial stock, and shifting into the digital age, amongst other items. Um, as a permit tech, I did have to undergo uh, um, uh, a SELA training, which was our way of uh, electronically submitting permits uh, to the city. Um, but with this whole new shift, I can't ignore the issues and complaints SEIU members have shared with me. Um, if you haven't heard, SEIU membership uh, started at 42%, but now is at 81. Um, and a valid common theme in these testimonials is mid-level management throughout all departments and divisions are ill-equipped with how to handle the shift into the future and how to effectively pivot their direct reports towards this future vision. If someone just scratched slightly beneath the surface, you will hear and feel chaos and unrest in our members. Um, I provide a su suggestion in the email as well, if you guys are interested, but just wanted to share um, that. So have a good day, bye. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Jayanta Day, followed by JT Faraji. Good evening, my name is Jayanta Day. I'm a resident of Bellheaven for the last 17 years. Uh, I came into Bellhaven and Menlo Park uh, because I had the privilege of being able to uh, get into one of the first houses that was considered um, a solar and a greenhouse uh, built in Menlo Park that I believe was one of the visions of the city of Menlo Park. Uh, this housing complex in Bellheaven was also featured on, on PBS and got national recognition. Um, I'm proud to be a member of uh, Bellhaven and uh, being part of this housing complex. And I wanna appreciate the city's leadership on climate, but like several others, I would like you to request, and I'd like to request the leadership continues to push to accelerate the work on climate change. Uh, including really going out and giving a public update on the climate action plan and accelerating work on electrification, including removing several barriers on processes and procedures and regulations that are within the city codes that makes it harder to uh, go and electrify houses. I'm fortunate that you know just last week I was able to Electrify you know this same house so, you know a house in 2007 that was called a greenhouse is now completely electrified there but I know um, that several others including myself have other barriers in uh, moving electrification along. So please consider my request uh, and look forward to partnering with the city and doing more around sustainability. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is J.T. Faraji, followed by Greg Goodwin. And this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, honorable members of the City Council and uh, City staff. Um, I'm here, uh, I wanted to um, just talk about uh, the Oneta Harris um, continuance. I think it's uh, very important um, to the community. Uh, the Harris uh, family, um, Israel, Oneta, have a huge legacy in both um, Bellhaven and East Palo Alto. Um, they were pioneers in um, the community for a very long time. Um, and I will say um, that I think that it's important that um, areas like Bellhaven uh, keep the cultural history um, in the community intact. 
um, it's um, it would feel um, much like an erasure uh, to lose the name. Um, and that to me, I feel would be pretty tragic. Um, I think that our youth um, need things to uh, look up to. Um, Onetta Harris is a perfect uh, example and a perfect um, legacy for people to look up to and to um, uh, reach for um, something to achieve um, as community workers um, in the community. Um, so uh, that's what uh, brings me out today is just to talk about um, Onetta Harris, uh, the legacy, um, what it means to both East Palo Alto and Bellhaven um, co uh, communities, <laughs> sorry. And um, so, yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Greg Goodwin, followed by James Pistorino. Good evening, Consul. Uh, the purpose of me being here again is to remind the Consul that is recent, I guess is two years ago or probably more, you voted unanimously to not change the name of the Oneta Harris Community Center. Um, I find it insulting that we always have to fight uh, to keep from being, like we're disposable or something to that effect. Onetta Harris is, she's the history of Bellhaven. Basically the community center is the history of Bellhaven. Um, you guys are looking at a name change like it's insignificant, but it's not. Um, Lawyers, doctors, professional athletes, firefighters, professors, everybody came out of that Donetta Harris Community Center because it was a functional asset to the community and it contributed more than we can ever describe here. Um, it kept kids out of, uh, from coming on this side of the freeway, burglarizing houses because they were in, in our neighborhood because they were being taught substantive life experience, uh, education and that kind of thing from the Onetta Harris Community Center and all of the uh, influences that came from professional athletes and the uh, people that came back to give back. I was one of the first black firefighters. We held college fairs there and uh, uh, we did a lot to make sure that we diverted the kids uh, that were on the road, on the path to prison. We took them and, and redirected them to a path of education and honor. Um, and that was, uh, that's directly attributable to what happened at Onetta Harris Community Center. You looking at the name change or not, but there's great significance in that community center and it should be acknowledged. We wanna again remind you that the council voted unanimously to not change the name. And now we have a contradiction of sorts because there's gonna be a name change um, and all we can relate it to is being forsaken possibly. So, um, I want to leave with this comment. Um, there is no, no form of bureaucracy that can overcome the ethics of those who administer it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is James Pistorino, followed by Yasmin Oakley. Uh, James, we're unable to hear you. You sound a little far away. Any better? Can you hear me? 
Uh, try again. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, no, it's very, very faint. How about now? Can you hear me now? That is a little better. Uh, no, I think we're losing the audio again. Nothing yet. No. <laughs> All right, I'll try and dial back in. Oh, wait. Uh, we might be able to hear you better now. Okay, I'll just, I just have a very brief comment. Again, this yeah, is yes, go right ahead. Again, this is James Pistorino. I just wanted to uh, comment and follow up on some of the many other commenters' uh, comments about the uh, climate action plan and what steps the uh, city council should take. And in particular, I wanted to um, urge the city council to, in fact, review the climate action plan, uh, plan and the city's efforts to add electrification slash uh, banning natural gas or natural gas appliances. Um, the city may be aware that uh, about a week ago, the Ninth Circuit uh, found that uh, similar efforts by the city of Berkeley were um, illegal and as preempted by federal law. So I do urge the city council to review that in particular. Um, as an effort to avoid um, litigation risks and, and costs of uh, dealing with that on something, again, that the Ninth Circuit has uh, just so recently addressed. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our final speaker will be Yasmin Oakley. Good evening. Can I be heard? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you for having me. Good evening to the city council. Good evening to the city staff and good evening to everyone in attendance. Of course, I represent East Palo Alto for reparations and our group and myself, we of course stand behind the name continuance for Oneta Harris. We are moved by her legacy. We are, we aspire to um, have the same commitment that she had to Menlo Park and to East Palo Alto. Um, I also would like to just publicly applaud uh, the family for leading us in this direction and leading us with compassion and care and upholding the legacy in such a amazing way. I would also like to applaud the Menlo Park community and East Palo Alto community, more specifically, as I affectionately call it, East Menlo Park, um, for the community for standing up and letting your voice be heard. Um, one of the gentlemen before me said that it's unfortunate that we always have to fight against erasure in our community, but it is what we must do. And we have done it so eloquently, and I'm so proud to be from East Palo Alto and proud to be from Menlo Park. So again, I would like to say, we do not want the name change. No, I have not even heard one person get up and say they are for the name change. So please consider the community in your decision, city council, so we can be proud of you too. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no further hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you everyone for your passionate and heartfelt comments. Um, I know we were, many of us were taking notes. We were all listening intently to your words and your stories and your attendance and engagement is greatly appreciated. Um, what I wanna do is um, see if we have any updates on the process for the naming policy. So city manager Murphy, is there any update or information you can provide on next steps regarding the naming? And actually I don't, uh, or pardon the interruption, we did have um, a hand raise since I uh, said there were no further hands. I'm not sure if it was for this item or a future item, but we do have a hand raised. Um, if, if that's one last public comment, we can, we can take it. Okay. One sec to bring the timer back up. 
Okay, and the hand that was raised is Warren Heyman. Warren, you should be able to unmute yourself and I just wanna confirm you have public comment on item E, which is general public comment. Uh, good evening again. My name is Dr. Warren Heyman. I'm a former principal of Bellhaven Elementary School and also one of the founders of the youth program at Bell at Oneta Harris Center Able. I'm speaking to the notion of not erasing history and that legacy matters. The name should not be changed because you don't want to erase history and you want to understand the importance of the legacy and life of Onetta Harris. I had the opportunity to visit the site thanks to Vice Mayor Taylor and I applaud you on what is going to be an outstanding facility. Not only am I supporting meaning the name, I'm also suggesting that a part of the programming should be including the life and legacy of Oneta Harris. So anyone and everyone who takes part in the programming should be able to understand why Oneta Harris is the name of the center that they are attending. I also want to point out that future programming for the center should include involvement from the community. And the program that existed and were successful need to be revisited and made available to the residents who will be utilizing the center. But most importantly, legacy matters and I asked the council not to erase the history. And I'm also moved by the fact that Mr. Goodwin pointed out that you did, maybe not you individually, but the council did unanimously vote not to change the name. So I'm asking you as a former principal of Bellhaven School, where well, Netta Harris was one of my counselors and worked with me in turning the community around to continue to leave the name Oneta Harris Community Center. Thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to a favorable response. Thank you for your comment. So at this time we are officially closing public comment item E. Mayor Willison may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you, Mr. Heyman, for that final comment. So um, as I was leaving off, um, I was seeing if City Manager Murphy could provide us any update. Uh, yeah, yes, Mayor, thank you. I just um, wanted to be able to share that the last time that the council, um, that this topic was on the agenda in March, the City Council directed staff to uh, focus on the programming um, and so that is indeed the uh, the near term focus and the topic of naming would not uh, come back to the city council until after the work on the programming was done. So the earliest per the current schedule that we're on that that would occur is uh, late summer or fall. So that's the update I can provide this evening. Thank you, um, City Manager Murphy. And thank you again to all of the public comments we received this evening on many topics. Um, with that, we are moving on from our general public comment agenda section. We are going on to O, which is our closed session. We are offering two opportunities for public comment this evening on the closed session item. The second call for public comment on the closed session item will be before adjourning to closed session later in the evening. So with that, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on closed session item O1? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our closed session item 01, closed session conference with labor negotiators, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, you can press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table. 
and return to the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Whit Loy with donated time from Sokni Sai and Joanna Chen. So pardon me, this is the first time I've done this in this forum. Um, good evening, Mayor Wilson, council members, fellow city employees and members of the public, uh, who's half of whom are exiting now. Um, my name is Whit Loy. I am the city's enterprise application administrator in the IT division, and I've been with the city for 14 years. Uh, Acela, OpenGov, and GIS are all examples of applications that I support. I am here this evening as the president have asked me to talk to you about pensions and more specifically the employee subsidy of the city's portion of the CalPERS contributions. This is a very technical subject, so we can follow up at a later time through the union channels if we need to. This is more commonly known as cost share. There is a provision in our MOU Section 14.6, it was given to you an example on the back side of the color spreadsheet. So you can look at the language directly if you want to. This language was going to be imposed on the unions in the, the negotiations of 2010 slash 2011 by a previous council. But ASME agreed at the 11th hour to help the city through the great recession that started back in 2008. SCIUs had their percentage imposed on them, still has those impositions in place today, and they have a higher rate that they pay into the cost share. I'm speaking to you from the ASME position, but SCIU also has a stake in this and a much higher one. In addition to the subsidy mentioned above, there is another issue relating to pensions and staffing. In 2010, local voters passed measure L, this created what we call a middle tier. So the city now has three tiers of pension, classic, middle, which was created with measure L, that's two at 60, and then we have the PEPRA calculation that is a statewide, um, that was passed through legislation signed by the governor. Those are all laid out to, with, in the spreadsheet in the example on the second page. This voter approved middle tier unfortunately has unintended consequences to the city as it relates to staffing. This is a, this is a perspective from myself, but I've seen from 10 year or 10 plus years of employment with the city. As it relates to staffing, more specifically management positions or people that have 10 or more years of into their career. We cannot attract talent from other agencies because those potential hires cannot bring their classic pension to the city. Because we cannot offer that to them. We would either be able to offer them the middle tier or the PEPRA calculation, depending on their specifics. This is in addition to paying the subsidy mentioned above. There isn't anything that we can do about this voter approved initiative but I think it's very important as we enter into negotiations that you understand the ramifications of some of these pre-existing agreements or impositions. We feel that the council needs to understand this and the time that wages, the cost of living, and what is considered to be the middle class are all hot topics locally and nationally. I do thank you for your time and the time that was afforded to me by my supporting members. Um, I am available, again, through the union channels if we do need to talk about this a little bit more, but again, we feel like this is very important to understand as we enter into negotiations that there are hidden costs that staff is paying, it's literally a subsidy to the city's contribution, and this does impact what we take home as far as being able to support our families, being able to maybe save for a home, being able to make a college payment, being able to pay down debt. This is a considerable amount of money that we're talking about that is actually ours. And we are, again, looking to have the conversation about leveling the playing field when it comes to pensions. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. 
And this will be the final call for public comment on closed session item O1. Seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you. Um, actually, Mr. Lloyd, I have questions about the, the spreadsheet, just some clarif clarifying questions. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Lloyd. So the, on the colorful part, yes. on the left-hand side, there's um, several abbreviated terms. Can you yes. let us know what those are? So those are uh, what we see on our pay stub. So this was an internal kind of document that I created for staff so we could take a look at what this we- This is mimicking what your paycheck looks like? Yeah, it's, it, I used an example, so there's no- Sure, the, sure. Not so good. on the left-hand side where it says on, from UKG, the CPM1 is the employee share. So that would be the mandated 8% that we would pay. But what is CPM1 and- UKG? I think, I, you know, I- Oh, okay. I, I've asked- uh, okay. I've gotten some breakdown from the department, but I don't really know what the definitions are, okay. but the, that is the 8%, the employee share. And then the CPPU asked me is what the, the subsidy or the cost share at this point. And that's really what we're talking about. The bold line across where it's 6.04% for under classic and then across the board, 6.04%. That's the cost share slash subsidy that we're talking about. The yellow portions below are on another portion of our pay stub and that they break down what the city pays. And so the, you can see what the city pays and the, to the contribution for, for CalPERS. Okay. And then further down, you, there is a benefit summary on the city's website that does have all of these broken out per uh, unit or, uh, union as well. And that's the hyperlink, okay. the benefit summary. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. So um, as a reminder, that was our first call for public comment on our closed session item. We will be taking additional public comment um, at the end of our open meeting prior to the council going into closed session. Um, so with that, we are moving on. Oh, it's, uh, yes, uh, City Council Member Nash, please. Excuse me, Mr. Loy, one more question, please. About that. Oh, no. Um, so on the city, the part that's in, um, right orange where it says city portion m1 mm -hmm. where it's only under classic is that only paid for classic no that should have been for? across that that's that's across the board for all employees i think it might change a little bit depending on ask me versus sciu um i apologize for that this was a, again a quick little math but the the orange should go across um for all tiers thank you yep all right i'll stay here just in case Last call for council for clarifying questions on the public comment. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Light. All right. Thank you. Okay. And with that, we are now moving on to F, which is our presentations and proclamations. Uh, City Clerk Heron, do we have any public comments on item F1, proclamation recognizing April 28th, 2023 as National Arbor Day? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on F1 proclamation recognizing April 28th as National Arbor Day, for those participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on item F. One, seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. 
So item F1 is the proclamation recognizing April 28th, 2023 as National Arbor Day. This is a summary of the proclamation. Arbor Day is a holiday that celebrates the planting, upkeep, and preservation of trees. For centuries, communities spanning the globe have found various ways to honor nature and the environment. When you commit to celebrating Arbor Day, you're doing more than helping put trees in the ground. You're saying yes to a healthier world. So grab your gardening gloves and join the city on April 29th at 10 a.m. at Carl E. Clark Park to celebrate our annual Arbor Day and recognize the city's 24th year of being a Tree City USA. Enjoy activities, giveaways, and an opportunity to learn about environmental justice. So I hope to see many of you on this coming Saturday in the Belhaven neighborhood at Carl E. Clark Park. It should be a beautiful day. All right, we are now moving on to G, advisory body vacancies and appointments. G1, consider applicants and make appointments to fill vacancies on various advisory bodies. To introduce this item is our city clerk, Judy Heron. Thank you, Mayor Willison. All right, so hello, city council. Uh, the item before you is to consider applicants and make appointments to fill vacancies on various uh, city council or various uh, advisory bodies. I would like to provide some updates to the staff report release uh, on April 20th. First, the Complete Streets Commission has two vacancies. One is a regular term through April of 2027, and one is an unexpired term through April of 2024, which was as a result of a resignation. The second update is that applicant Matthew Normington is an incumbent on the FAC, and that was not noted in the staff report. Third, on attachment E, Jeff Schmidt's expiration should have been April 30th of 2026, not April of 2023. Um, and then I did want to provide an update to the council that since the close of annual recruitment on April 7th, uh, we did receive one applicant to the Housing, Parks, and Recreation and Planning Commissions, one applicant to the Planning Commission and Finance and Audit Committee, and one applicant to the Finance and Audit Committee. Given that these were received after the deadline, they were not included in uh, the annual recruitment, but I did connect with each applicant and let them know uh, about future recruitments. So staff is recommending that the city council consider applicants and make appointments to the Complete Streets Commission, Environmental Quality Commission, a Finance and Audit Committee, Housing Commission, Library Commission, Parks and Recreation Commission, and the Planning Commission. Um, one update that I did miss from the staff report was uh, Sally Cole's district um, was listed as four and it, uh, Sally Cole's actually in district five. So apologies for that. Looking at this slide for the Complete Streets Commission vacancies, the city council can either appoint applicants and direct which applicants will serve on the regular and unexpired term, or the city council can appoint applicants and direct staff to perform a random drawing denoting who will serve each term. Staff would like to highlight the options presented in the staff report related to the finance and audit committee. There are five FAC vacancies and four applicants. The city council can, number one, appoint current applicants to the FAC and select an applicant from the current pool of applicants that applied to another advisory body. This would result in a full seven member body compiled of Menlo Park residents. Number two, the city council can appoint three applicants to the FAC and direct staff to update city council policy CC-23-004, updating the FAC composition from seven to five members. The city council can appoint current applicants to the FAC 
and extend the FAC recruitment period for two weeks to fill any unappointed seats. And lastly, number four, the city council can refrain from appointing applicants to the FAC at this time, extend the FAC recruitment for two weeks, and request the expiring members to continue serving on the FAC until appointments are made. Those members would be Matt Normington, Brian Westcott, and Carol Wong. Matt Normington and Carol Wong are incumbents who have reapplied to continue serving on the FAC, and Brian Westcott is terming out of the FAC on April 30th of this year, having served two consecutive terms. Brian has also applied for the EQC and PRC, or Environmental Quality and the Park and Recreation Commissions. This does conclude my presentation. Happy to answer any questions or open it up to public comment. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, will you be reviewing the kind of voting procedure after public comment or? Yes, that's how I have it presented now. Okay, thank you. Um, so at this time, uh, we'll go ahead and open uh, look, Actually, are there any council clarifying questions about what's going on here? Council Member Combs. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor Willison. Um, I just want to clarify when it comes to scenarios where applicants have applied to more than one commission, we don't have a process where, where they rank their priorities, do, do we? So we don't have like a set in place process. If an applicant expresses to me a preference, I noted in the staff report. Okay. Um, uh, okay, thanks. And I think in this case, there was one who showed preference. I can't recall offhand, but. Um, City Clerk, Karen, do you remember who that was? Uh, yeah, I can look at. Uh, okay. Why don't you get back to us after public comment? Okay. So we'll give you a minute to look for that. Um, so yes, let's please, um, unless there's any other questions from council, um, let's hear public comment. All right. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G1, consider applicants and make appointments to fill vacancies on various advisory bodies. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. And looking at the staff report, uh, the one preference shown was Brian Westcott, who applied for Environmental Quality Commission and Park and Recreation Park and Recreation Commission, had a preferred choice of the Environmental Quality Commission. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. You're welcome. All right. So our first speaker will be Andrew Erich, followed by Jessica Gilmartin. Good evening, Mayor Wallison and City Council. I'm Andrew Eric. I'm an applicant for three commissions. I just want to thank you for your consideration. And I'm here tonight just to express my commitment in serving the city of Menlo Park. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Jessica Gil Martin, followed by Brian Kissel. Jessica, are you still in the building? Okay, I will go to Brian Kessel. Good evening, I'm Mayor Wilson and City Council members. Thanks for uh, providing the time for me to provide my input. Um, this, I, some of you may know, this is my second application for the Environmental Quality Commission. Um, following up on the comments earlier this evening from John McKenna and Di Diane Bailey, um, I share their concerns that climate change is a critical and urgent issue facing you know, our community, a state, the county, and the planet. And I would um, welcome the opportunity to serve on the Environmental Quality Commission uh, to help Menlo Park uh, with uh, the Climate Action Plan and the various uh, subcommittees that are uh, pursuing a number of important initiatives um, that will have an impact not only in Menlo Park, but I believe across the state and the country. 
uh, given that Menlo Park has established itself as a, a thought leader and a pioneer in, in environmental um, justice and climate change. Um, in coming to the, uh, to the committee for consideration, I have spoken with a number of the members, current and former members of the Environmental Quality Commission, so I, I have a, an understanding of what their responsibilities are. Um, my background does include some, uh, some work with the Menlo, Menlo Park um, City Government. I was an alternate on the uh, Independent Redistricting Commission. I've been an advocate and supporter of the Park Protection Ordinance, um, working with the Parks and Recreation Commission on pickleball support, and I have been involved in the housing element planning process. Personally, um, I have the time to do this. I'm now semi-retired and spending the bulk of my time working on climate-related issues. I'm on the board of advisors with an organization called Revolve, out of San Francisco that provides solar power for other nonprofits under power purchase agreements. I'm a consultant with an organization called selfhelp.org, which is a national um, CDFI credit union um, developing lending programs, below market lending programs for low income and disadvantaged communities for EVs. Um, I have co-founded a Stanford GSB Climate Sustainability Interest Group working with Renee Hirschberg at the Alumni Association and partnering with the Door School of Sustainability. Um, I have personally electrified my own home, uh, both heat pump, hot water heater, working with Sun Work Org and uh, HVAC with Fuse H, uh, HVAC services. And in that, working with both PCE and Bayren for the various incentive programs that they have. Um, I've also applied for NEM 2.0 solar uh, service uh, through uh, re-roof for the GF Timberline integrated solar system. So I have a lot of knowledge on what's required for home electrification that I could bring to, to the role. So thanks for considering me for the position. Thank you for your comment. And this will be the final call for public comment on item G1. And I will give one final call for Jessica Gilmartin, just in case. Seeing none. Um, Mayor Willison, would you like me to uh, go over the process of appointments? Uh, yes, please. Will do. All right, so uh, for the city council, when I state your name, you will Provide names of the candidates you wish to appoint. You can uh, make the selection based on how many vacancies that we have available. And let me just bring up my screen for a helpful visual. So in this instance, there would be two vacancies. So each city council member would uh, state two names for appointment. The city council, as uh, each member of the city council also has the option to not select an applicant and leave a seat vacant. A person achieving the majority of nominations will result in appointment by acclamation. If a tie results, we will take the applicants who tied and proceed with another round of voting. For Robert's rules, uh, the or roll call will be in alphabetical order with the mayor being called last. And with that, I would ask if the city council has a preference on the uh, order we do the appointments. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, two things. Um, one, I would propose we do planning commission first and then go alphabetically. So complete streets would be next and as we have had in our documentation. So can I first see if there's support to have the planning commission be the first? I'm seeing nods, I'm seeing nods all around. Um, secondly, I think we should start with the question of what to do about the finance and audit committee. Um, going back to the slide that city clerk Heron presented us with our options before going into making our, our nominations. Um, so I do think um, I see some interest in speaking from some of my colleagues. Uh, Council member Nash. <laughs> Last time for the planning commission, we used um, ballots. And I'm wondering if we will do that again. And I would like to do that. I thought that worked well for the planning commission only. 
I can make that happen on the fly if it is the direction of the council. Council member comes, you do have something to say. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, eventually, right? I always have something to say. Uh, um, I, I'm supportive of that. And I would actually also object to, to going in order um, because again, that's a, a process with which I always go first. And so I know that's Robert's role, but in theory, we should have a tote board or something that I think the staff has been saying for two or three years would, would come back. And so what I would suggest is that, that there'd be a rotation and that we'd start with like the, whoever is the last, again, excluding the mayor first. And then I, I think that that's, that's fair. Um, and so, um, uh, no, no, again, normally I don't mind going first, but it does sort of irk me in these situations where I'm always asked to, to, to vote first. Um, again, when I don't, I don't think it, it's when in theory, this, there should be an easy electronic solution to this that has existed on council before. Any other comments? Or, or we can do a ballot for all, which was, uh, uh, council member Nash's suggestion. Um, yeah, perhaps. So, um, I, sounds like there's two options on the table in terms of voting. Um, I guess we should go and say our preference. We can do it out in any order. Um, if you prefer to do random or, uh, ballot and for the members of the public, when we're talking about ballot, what would happen is the clerk would hand us post-it notes. We would put our two, um, names on it. So we can't see what everyone else is putting. And then the city clerk would broadcast to everyone who voted for what. So it's not secret who we're voting for. We just don't have the benefit of knowing what each other is doing prior to doing it ourselves. Um, so uh, Council Member Dorr, do you have a preference on uh, method? I appreciate uh, Council Member Combs' recommendation of doing it in a rotation. Okay. I'm seeing a nod from uh, Council Member Taylor or Vice Mayor Taylor, do you have a preference? Okay, so why don't we just go ahead and, and rotate with the exception of the Planning Commission, um, which will go first and do by ballot. Um, so as I mentioned, um, City Clerk Karen, if you could please start with that slide about the Finance and Audit Committee. Um, so we first need to make a decision on what we want to do about the Finance and Audit Committee. Uh, we decided at a previous meeting that we wanted it ideally to be a seven member body. There are two people, I believe, who will remain on the Finance and Audit Committee who have not had their terms end. That's Michael DeMoss and Susanna Hill. So they're remaining members. We have four applicants right now. So um, that would bring us to six. And then as the city clerk mentioned, there are additional candidates who have shown interest and applied. Um, so does anyone want to propose one of these four options? Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. I'm comfortable with option three. Okay, so uh, that is a uh, appointing applicants tonight and then um, knowing that we may have, well, we definitely would not have seven tonight, um, extending the recruitment additional two weeks. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Uh, Council Member Nash. I could go with three, but I would recommend four um, only because anyone who doesn't isn't appointed to another commission tonight might be interested in serving on the Finance and Audit Committee. And that would provide that option. Having said that, I guess I would go with three because someone who's already applied to the Finance and Audit Committee has a um, stronger interest. So I would go with three. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Did, did we have additional applicants that came in after the deadline for FAQ? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Let me pull up my notes. Yes. Yeah, so after the deadline of April 7th, we had one applicant applied to uh, housing, Parks and Rec, and Planning Commissions. We had another applicant apply to Planning Commission and Finance and Audit. And then a, an additional applicant apply only to the Finance and Audit Committee. So we have currently two interested applicants in FAC. Uh, Council Member Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Willison. I, I think I was, if I'm remembering correctly, um, uh, had most concerns about uh, expanding to a seven-member body in the heart of my uh, concerns was was recruiting, being able to recruit enough people to fill a seven member body. Um, it seems as though that concern was not um, valid or certainly not not come to fruition. So um, I, I would be supportive of, of um, 
uh, direction outlined in option three. Okay, I see council member door you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I noticed uh, from an email from one of the folks who applied late to the FAC that uh, did not do so in part because of, of realizing that we need to have the full seven person body. And so I, I do share some of the concern about ongoing ability to maintain seven folks, um, but would be comfortable at this moment going ahead with, with number three. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we have council consensus to go with option three, and then um, each council member will have an opportunity to decide how many of the applicants to name. They can name all four or a lesser number. It's it's up to their discretion. So um, before launching into um, the appointments, um, I just, on behalf of the council and council members, are free to make their own comments. Want to thank everybody for applying. This was a tremendous pool of residents who have um, expressed an interest to serve their city. It's really remarkable reading all the applications and seeing the willingness and enthusiasm of our community to come out and volunteer and be part of local government. So um, we always say that sometimes um, you apply and you don't get selected and you apply again and you might not get selected. So persistence counts. Um, and uh, we really do consider a lot of different factors, um, each of us in making an appointment. Um, we try to balance out the committees in whatever way we think that's appropriate. And so um, please do not get too discouraged if you are not selected. Um, I believe council member Combs, were you, you tell a story every year, but okay. We won't go over council member Combs story, but um, people do get appointed on their second or third try. So um, just thank you again. And I encourage residents who did not apply um, to, to get in on the action too. Um, so does anyone else wanna say anything? Uh, Council Member Combs. Yeah, yeah, I'll say something, not, not the story I tell, but I do wanna say that like um, echoing what the mayor said, I felt very so, sort of underqualified in reading these applications and that like I get to make this decision. It was really a, a fairly, uh, like I say, impressive group. And, and yeah, I just want to echo, echo the mayor's uh, statements about that. So what we've been doing, um, as the city clerk outlined, is kind of going straight to the votes and not necessarily having discussions around each of these. Um, if a council member feels the need to state their rationale, they have that ability, but it seems to be most efficient and kind of in the best interest of um, collegiality and civility in our city to just kind of make your decision and, and move on. And then folks can always follow up with council members if they have questions um, about our decisions. But um, I think that's where we're going to go tonight. So um, let's let's go. Thank you. Okay, so um, on everyone's screens, you will see the applicants for our planning commission. Again, we have two regular terms that will expire in April of 2027. So I'm going to pass out a ballot. If each uh, member of the council could write their name at the top and up to two names of those applicants they wish to serve on the planning commission. And then I'll come around, collect and display on the screen and read into the record. And a question, uh, City Clerk, Aaron, should I send an email to you? Um, you can shoot me a text. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, give me just a couple of moments here to input what we have.
Okay. Votes are in. And based on the majority of the votes here, we have five votes for Andrew Eric and three votes for Katie Farrick. So by um, it, it doesn't change the vote, but my uh, vote was tabulated wrong. Sure was. Thank you. Let me just make sure that. And Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. I apologize for that very, very much. Okay. The rest look correct. So still with five for Andrew and three for Katie. Uh, by acclamation, we can make those two appointments. Right. Great. Great. Um, do you want us to? As long as I, I think we're fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so now we want to go in alphabetical order. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then to, I guess, mix it up, I'm going to start in alpha and then um, just change it up by one. So in this case, we are looking at our complete streets commission. And again, the city council does have a decision to make here as well, as we have one regular term ending in April of 2027 and one un unexpired term ending in April of 2024. Um, city council can either make an appointment to each of the terms or direct staff to do a random draw of who serves which term. Um, yeah, I think, um, I, I think I said we wouldn't comment. I do think there's one incumbent if, if um, so I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I believe council member Combs, uh, why don't we start with the longer term and see if, uh, why don't we have council make a decision on the longer term and then move to the shorter term. And if there's a problem with the splitting of the votes or something, we'll go from there. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mayor Willison. So uh, we'll start with city council member Combs, your one candidate for the regular term. Uh, Jackie Sebrin. Thank you. Uh, city council member Dower. Also Jackie. Thank you. City Council Member Nash. Jackie Sebrian. Sebrian. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Jackie Sebrian. Thank you. Mayor Willison. Jackie Sebrian. Thank you. So with a total of five by acclamation, the City Council is appointing Jackie Sebrian to the regular term on the Complete Streets Commission. Thank you. If Council Member comes comfortable with the next one. Yeah. Great. Because we're in the same. Yeah, we're in the same body. So please give your second. Uh, yeah, Ross Silverstein. Thank you. City Council Member Dower. Ross Silverstein. Thank you. Uh, City Council Member Nash. Ross Silverstein. Thank you. And Vice Mayor Taylor. Ross Silverstein. Thank you. And Mayor Willison. Ross Silverstein. Okay. So with a total of five, the City Council appoints Ross Silverstein to the unexpired term for the Complete Streets Commission. Congratulations. And can I say, just say, if you guys are always going to follow my vote, then I can always go first now. Like I have. <laughs> All right. So we are moving rapidly along to our Environmental Quality Commission, or EQC. We have two regular terms ending in April of 2027. So for each city council member, you can select up to two of our applicants, and I will start with City Council Member Doer. Thank you. I'd like to uh, vote for Brian Kissel and Jeanne today. Thank you. City Council Member Nash. Eduardo Pellegri Lopart and Brian Kissel. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Jayanta Day and Susan Prohaska. Thank you. Mayor Willison. This is hard. Oh, great. Oh, the mayor gets to go last all the time. Oh, okay. okay. We can do that. There are best. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Combs. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've sort of mixed this up tonight with my, but my thing is that the mayor would still always go last. Great. Got um, it. 
Um, so, <laughs> no worries. Uh, Brian Kissel and Eduardo Pellegrini Low Park. Low Park. Thank you. And now Matt Willison. Thank you. Um, gosh, you made it. Okay, um, I'll go with Brian Kissel. Um, and then I'm I'm going to go with Eduardo Pellegrini Low Park. Thank you. So but this was not an easy one. Not at all. Really okay. excellent applicants all, uh, for all commissions, but especially this one. So we've got uh, Brian Kissel with four of the votes, Eduardo uh, Pellegrini Lopart with three. So by acclamation, the city council is appointing Brian and Eduardo. Congratulations. Um, FAC, and I know the city council directed option three. So even for me, let me refresh. Okay, so uh, the city council can appoint up to five, but we have four applicants. So up to four applicants, and then I will be extending the recruitment by two weeks and then returning the appointments to the city council. So with that, I will start um, again. So up to four candidates per city council member. And I will start with city council member Nash. I would like to nominate all four or appoint all four. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, City Clerk. Um, I actually would like to point um, Jeff, Matthew, and Carol. I was looking to see if Virginia was actually online because she applied for three um, to ask her what her preference was. I would like to appoint her actually to the Housing Commission. Thank you. Uh, City Council Member Combs. Sorry, I'll, I'll point all four. Thank you. That's not right. All right, uh, City Council Member Doer. Um, Gwen, can I add commentary? Because I would love to add some commentary. You can add commentary, <laughs> Council. Okay, thank you. Um, I've had conversation with Virginia Port uh, Portillo. We met at the Environmental Justice, uh, one of the meetings that happened in, at the Bellhaven Library. Um, and we spoke separately again. Uh, I think she has fantastic interests and skills and would love to see her um, involved in one of the other two commissions that she applied for and um, would really, uh, therefore my vote is uh, for the other three, for Jeff, Matthew and Carol, seeing as I think her skills and expertise could be uh, better brought in other spaces. Thank you. Thank you, City Council Member Doer. And finally, Mayor Willison. Um, thank you, Council Member Dorr, for that um, perspective. Um, so with that having been said, and for you having done that homework, thank you. Um, I'll follow your lead and do um, three, and I'll, I'll be planning on voting for her um, for the Housing Commission. Thank you. So we've got uh, three appointments going to be made with five uh, votes each, uh, Jeff Leroy, Matthew Normington, and Carol Wong uh, are all being, re uh, two are being reappointed. Uh, Jeff is a new appointment to the Finance and Audit Committee with a regular term ending April of 2025. Congratulations. And our next commission is going to be the Housing Commission. So, I will start with, oh, let's see, we've got one vacancy. So each city council member can select one candidate. And I'll start with uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. I'll nominate Virginia Portillo. Thank you. City Council Member Combs. Brooke uh, Freewing. Thank you. City Council Member Doer. Virginia Portillo. City Council Member Nash. So I will make some commentary this time. Um, I have communicated with Kate O'Connell, who I think would be a fantastic um, housing commissioner, but she is concerned that she will not be in the district for long. So with that, I will vote for uh, Virginia Portillo. Thank you. And Mayor Willison. As mentioned, I'll be voting for Virginia Portillo. 
Thank you. So with a total of four, the city council is appointing Virginia Portillo to the housing commission uh, for one regular term. Congratulations. Next, our library commission, where we have two regular term vacancies. Each city council member can select up to two uh, applicants, and we are going to start with city council member Combs. Okay, um, so Carol Orton um, and uh, Jennifer Wise. Thank you. Uh, city council member Dower. Carol Orton and Jennifer Wise. Thank you. City council member Nash. Carol Orton and Jennifer Wise. Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Carol Orton and Jennifer Wise. Mayor Willison. So I guess when Council Member Combs starts, we all agree. <laughs> so I'm going to follow with uh, Carol Orton and Jennifer Wise. Thank you. So with uh, five votes for each, we have Carol Orton and Jennifer Wise being appointed to regular terms on the Library Commission. Congratulations. Next up is our Park and Recreation Commission. We have a total of two vacancies. And I believe Andrew was selected for Planning Commission, if I'm not incorrect. All right. And I'll remove Andrew. Give me just one more second here. Okay. All right. So we've got two vacancies on the park and recreation. They are regular terms. Each city council member can select up to two candidates. And I will start with city council member Doer. Thank you. I'd like to select Jessica Gilmartin and Juan Menley. Thank you. City council member Nash. Jessica Gilmartin and Juan Menley. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Woman Lee and Jessica Gilmart. Thank you. Uh, City Council Member Combs. Um, Brian Westcott and Woman Lee. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Willison, please. Jessica Gilmartin and Juan Monley, please. Thank you. So with five votes, Juan Manley will be appointed to the Park and Recreation Commission and Jessica Gilmartin will be appointed with the four. Congratulations. And with that, I think we have completed all of our appointments. Wonderful job. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, for running that extremely efficient appointment. Um, item. Um, so actually it's 757. I know we've only been going for two hours, but I'm going to propose a short five minute break. So this is a short five minute break. Thank you.
Okay, having our city council return to our virtual and in-person days. Mayor Willison, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So um, there has actually been a request to reorder um, the public hearing to be now before the study session. Um, and so we will go ahead and do that. So we are moving on first to J1, which is our public hearing. So bear with me. And after that, we will move on to our study session. Public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. This public hearing was held at the regular city council meeting on Tuesday, March 14th, 2023, and was continued to today, Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Tonight's public hearing is consider the planning commission's recommendations to approve the vesting tentative map extension and adopt a resolution to approve a two-year extension of a vesting tentative map to merge the existing SP ECRD El Camino Real downtown specific plan lots abandon a portion of Alto Lane and create a two lot subdivision for condominium purposes with 12 residential units, one restaurant space, and up to three retail spaces on one lot in the SP ECRD zoning district at 201 El Camino Real and two townhouses on the second lot in the R3 apartment zoning district at 612 Cambridge Avenue. And to introduce this item is our associate planner, Matthew Pruder. Please, Mr. Pruder. Good evening, uh, Mayor Wilson, council members and members of the public. Thank you very much. I apologize as I'm just pulling up my presentation now. Let's just be one moment and then I'll begin. Thank and you for your flexibility. I know we surprised you with reordering the agenda. Thank you, <laughs> no problem at all. Okay, thank you for everyone's patience. Uh, again, as stated earlier, my name is Matt Pruder. I'm with the uh, planning division and we're, uh, I'm presenting this evening on the uh, proposed vesting tentative map extension request, which was continued from the last meeting, um, or the meeting of March 14th, 2023. This is for 201 El Camino Real and 612 Cambridge Avenue uh, combined. And uh, I'll just uh, briefly have a presentation here and then we'll follow that with any staff questions. And I'd like to also mention that our applicant representative, the property owner is in attendance at city hall tonight at the council chambers and he can follow my remarks uh, with his own. So just as a general recap, the proposed project was approved back in 2020 and it involved two uh, components mainly, uh, which were one, a mixed use building that had 12 housing units on site, a restaurant unit, and up to three retail units, and then two townhouse buildings on an adjacent parcel. And combined, there was underground parking that was also proposed with this mixed use building. There was um, a two year window for the mapping to be filed and They've now uh, requested, the applicant team has requested for an extension request, which we had taken uh, to, as I said before, the March 14th meeting, and that got continued to a date certain, which is tonight's meeting. And so we're uh, working on that action today. This is an item that you'll vote on for the vesting tentative map extension. Just as a recap for the last meeting with the city council where this item was continued, we had uh, a few concerns um, brought up that required the continuation continuance of the project. And they mainly had to do with the progress of the project development, trash and debris that was reported on site, occupation of the site by unhoused individuals, 
general safety, and tree health as well. The applicant has been working closely with the city and also with members of the community, and as I understand it, um, some of the council members as well, regarding some of these issues and trying their best to address it. And uh, just listing out here a few items since that meeting over the last month or so, they've removed trash and installed fencing, uh, perimeter fencing around the entire property. They've covered uh, several damage points of entry with wood boards to protect these areas that were seemingly broken into or vandalized. They reinstated their demolition permit applications, which had gotten expired, but uh, working with the building division, they'd worked that out so that we now have active demolition permits on file that we are, again, actively reviewing. They have been preparing additional reports and documentation for the issuance of these demolition permits. Based on the approval in 2020, there are several conditions of approval and mitigation and monitoring and reporting program measures, MMRP measures that will need to be fulfilled or in some ways satisfied before we could issue a demolition permit. And so just to clarify that a little further, these include some documents that include a nesting bird survey, a bat survey, a noise and vibration analysis, and there are also other documents as well. They had held a community meeting um, this past weekend on April 22nd, and they've also been in the process of scheduling tree trimming to address the earlier tree concerns. And uh, the applicant has also stated they've been doing some daily site monitoring. And I'd like to just note on the last three button uh, items specifically, as with the, all the other items that the applicant, um, it's our understanding from staff that the applicant has been working on this uh, from what they've told us, but we'd like to point out that the applicant is available to clarify this further and explain more of the details on that specifically. And that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. And following that, we can have our um, property owner come up and say some remarks as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I see a hand raised by council member door. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that the meeting was held at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday, April 22nd, and I'd love to get a number of how many people were able to attend that meeting. I'll initially respond to that. Thank you, council member door. Our applicant uh, representative, the property owner, can, can address that question uh, more directly. So I, I'd leave it to them, uh, defer to him to uh, come and speak on that. Thank you. When he presents. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. It, it sounds like maybe we should uh, hear from the applicant um, and then we can go from there. So good evening, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor and uh, members of the council. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, um, my, um, in particular, I wanted to address the number of concerns that existed before in the last meeting. Um, since then, we've done a number of different mitigations, as Matthew pointed out, including fencing the property, ensuring that there is no access point to the property, cleaning up the property, and um, we're in the process of pruning the trees and doing a number of different things to secure the property. I want to th thank uh, Councilperson Nash for organizing a community meeting uh, last Saturday at 9.30. There was approximately uh, six people, I believe, that attended um, from the community. And we had a um, long two-hour discussion about the nature of the project and all the different things that we planned on doing there. Um, and I think the meeting um, ended with me committing to having this on a monthly basis so that we could have more discussions about the nature of the project and how it was progressing. Um, the number of mitigating um, items, including the bird nesting, uh, acoustic analysis, um, are in progress. We've, we're contacting uh, the appropriate uh, experts to do those things. Um, uh, phase two was done, um, and we submitted that to the city. Um, for the review, and I think that was something that Matthew now has. Um, apart from that, I think the the most important thing is that we're doing everything we can to ensure that the community understands um, what our intentions are, but it was a very good discussion. I think we have a very good, uh, relate. now we have a pretty good relationship with the community. I think you, you were there. And uh, our commitment is to continue to communicate and meet with the members of the community and also some of the suggestions that they had, which I thought was very good and, so, you know, and helpful in terms of being able to accelerate the project and get the project on board. So we have now our demolition permit 
uh, you know, reinstated. And as soon as we get these mitigating circumstances under our belt, we hope to be able to get the demolition permit issued, at which point we hope to move forward with um, a demolition of the site and securing the site and doing the grading that's necessary to prep the site. Um, our plans have been submitted and we have received preliminary um, reviews and we're expecting to get additional reviews from the plan checkers. There are five plan checkers in the city that currently are working on providing us the different, there's three different permits, one for um, the demolition and then one for the two townhouses and then a separate one for the commercial and the mixed use site. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to pull those in the next 40 to 60 days. And then uh, we're in the process of selecting a contractor. In fact, I was on the phone with them today. Um, and um, once that selection takes place, we hope to move forward very quickly after that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any questions I can answer? So um, if there's any clarifying questions from the council at this time, we still need to take public comment, um, but we do have our applicant and our staff available for questions. Thank you very much, well, Councilperson Nash. I really appreciate you uh, stepping in and helping out and organizing that. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so City Clerk Karen, at this time, can you please call for public comment? Um, actually, I know this is a public hearing. So I would, um, so just for members of the public, when there's a public hearing, there's a very prescribed order and script for us to read. So I would now like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willis, and I appreciate uh, you following the script. So for now, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item J1, our public hearing related to a resolution approving a two-year extension of a vesting tentative map, uh, merging the existing El Camino and downtown specific plan, plan lots, abandon a portion of Alta Lane, creating a two lot subdivision for condominium purposes and 12 residential use in, uh, units, one restaurant space, uh, up to three retail spaces on the lot in the SPECRD zoning district at 201 El Camino Real and two townhouses. On the second lot are three apartment zoning district at 612 Cambridge. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card with that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on our public hearing J1. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So with that, I will now close the public hearing and open it up for council discussion. Um, actually, before we launch in, um, it was striking that we had quite a few public commenters the last time this came forward and no public commenters this time. So I just wanna confirm um, City <laughs> Manager Murphy um, or Mr. Pruder that the residents um, who had previously made comments were well aware that this meeting was taking place. Uh, yeah, yes, Mayor, I can confirm that uh, given the majority of them were uh, present at the meeting on Saturday, per my understanding, yes, they were quite aware of tonight's meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe um, City Council Member Nash, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I am very happy that we took the break and had the time to bring the community together with the property owner, with Mr. Tamirian. And it was a very um, excellent conversation on Saturday. I think that everybody walked away um, very pleased and with strong support for the project. And with that, I am ready to move that we, um, approve this um, project as has been um, as with the action. All right, is there a second or uh, Vice Mayor Taylor? I'll second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash, a second by Vice Mayor Taylor. 
to approve a tentative map extension request and adopt a resolution to approve a two-year extension of a vesting tentative map associated with a majority subdivision to merge the existing SP-ECR-D lots, abandon a portion of Alto Lane, and create a two-lot subdivision for condominium purposes with 12 residential units, one restaurant space, and up to three retail spaces in one of the lots and two townhouses on the second lot in the R3 apartment zoning district. Any further city council questions or discussion? Uh, city clerk here. I just wanted to thank council member Nash um, for her leadership on this item and um, that the community and the applicant and the residents for coming together. Um, and this is a really happy ending that we don't always see at city council. So I just wanted to take a moment and feel that positivity. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Any other city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Dower? Yes. City council member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So as a reminder to the public, we jumped forward with the public hearing. So now we are going back in time to item H, which is our study session. Study sessions are an opportunity for city staff to introduce an item that will require policy direction from the city council in the near future. City staff will provide a brief presentation. I will then call for public comment. After public comment, the City Council will discuss the matter interactively with staff. The City Council will not take an action on items addressed in study sessions. The City Council may provide direction to City staff for preparation of additional analysis or information necessary when the item returns to the City Council for action. The study session item is H1, provide direction on the Caltrain Quiet Zone study. And to introduce this item is our Assistant Public Works Director, Hugh Louch. Mr. Louch. Thank you, Mayor Wilson and members of council. Um, I will start my screen share. Let's see. So thanks for having us uh, here today to talk about this. Um, I'll do a quick intro and then pass it off to Peter Meyerhofer of Kimley Horn, who's been our consultant helping us with the project. Um, as you know, this is something that's been requested for quite a long time um, and in the works as a study for uh, the better part of a year. Um, we have been through kind of a, a process to get to this point um, and we're excited and know you have a lot more on the agenda. So I'll hand it off to Peter and he can walk you through the um, rest of the presentation. Good evening, thank you. All right, let's get going. So uh, quiet zone, we're in the midst working with Hugh on a quiet zone study for the corridor through the city. Uh, this includes a number of different crossings we're gonna talk about. Um, quick overview, we'll talk about what a quiet zone is, the basics of it, uh, the process we're going through right now, the study area that uh, this uh, analysis includes, the proposed safety improvements that uh, are recommended to uh, qualify for quiet zone and then next steps. All right. So why do trains sound their horns? Railroads are regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration, the FRA. The FRA requires train operators to sound their horns as they approach areas where the railroad intersects a roadway uh, or railroad crossing. Uh, the train horns acts as a fail safe in the event that warning devices, gates and bells don't work or don't prohibit a person or vehicle from entering the crossing. Uh, the train horn is supposed to be loud enough to catch attention. Uh, the train horns are required to sound at specific volumes, generally 96 to 100 decibels. In addition, they have to sound the horns beginning 20 seconds prior to entering the crossing. And just to recap what a quiet zone is, a quiet zone is a section of a railroad in which the train operator does not need to sound the train horn as it is approaching a crossing. For a quiet zone to be implemented, a crossing or set of crossings must meet certain safety thresholds as determined by the FRA. And most crossings would not qualify for a quiet zone in their current state, so there are upgrades that are gonna be required to make them safe enough that a horn does not need to sound. So this is achieved by what we call adding in supplemental safety measures, SSMs, at the crossings ensure that the quiet zone risk index for the crossing or the set of crossings qualifies under the FRA guidelines to be a quiet zone. So, so where we're at in the project right now, 
Um, we're in the phase one of the study. So we've been going through a significant agency coordination with uh, stakeholders such as Caltrain, CPUC, uh, the FRA, the city of course, and um, we've, uh, through their input in doing field diagnostic meetings, we've come uh, together with a conceptual design that have all agreed upon. Um, we've taken that design, done a safety analysis per the FRA guidelines uh, to come up with and finalize the conceptual improvements you'll see here in a minute, um, going through public outreach, and then we'll be summarizing all this in a final report. And then the next phase of the project would be the actual permitting of the design uh, with the CPUC and Caltrain, uh, developing final design construction documents, CDs uh, for construction, and then uh, finally uh, getting FRA certification for the, uh, the quiet zone. So this quiet zone um, actually goes through, majority of it through Menlo Park. There is one crossing through Palo Alto, um, and it includes Encinal, Glenwood, Oak Grove, uh, the Menlo Park Station, and Ravenswood Avenue. And then the, the one location in Palo Alto is at the, the uh, Palo Alto Avenue Alma Street crossing. And it's about 1.5 miles in length. Okay. Um, one of the primary safety improvements we're looking at for these crossings to, to make them um, compatible for a quiet zone would be uh, four quad gates. So the four quad gate system prohibits cars from driving around gates that are in the down position and moving onto the tracks. It essentially creates a barrier across the roadway to protect against crashes. Uh, the four quad gate systems are a type of a supplemental safety measure that reduces the risks associated with the crossing per FRA guidelines. Um, this system prohibits cars from driving around gates that are in the down position and moving onto the tracks. It essentially creates that barrier that we talk about. Um, an alternative a measure that we can sometimes use is raised medians that are designed high enough to prevent vehicles from driving over. Although with the, the crossings we're looking at within Menlo Park with all the driveways and adjacent uh, cross streets, the putting in the medians just wasn't a feasible option. So uh, one example here is at Ravenswood, again, with the four quad gate system we're talking about, it also includes uh, sidewalk realignment and refreshing of the striping and signage. Uh, these concept designs, both at Ravenswood and all the crossings, involved a number of engineers um, and uh, included upgrades and reconfigurations to the sidewalks and the gate infrastructure. Um, these improvements uh, correspond to the recommendations by the FRA and the field diagnostic team, as I mentioned, including Caltrain and CPUC. And um, the sidewalks, so might ask why we're doing improvements to the sidewalks. So the sidewalks are realigned to make more of a streamlined path of travel across the tracks. And, the, and then we're adding the gates and infrastructure relating to the pedestrian safety there as well. So not just the vehicles, we're adding pedestrian gates and swing gates. Okay. Oak Grove Avenue, another one with the four quad gates, uh, sidewalk realignment, striping. Um, and I'll just note on this one at the Oak Grove intersection, in addition to the four quad gate system, uh, we're gonna be extending the median on the south leg as well. So thereby preventing um, left turns by the southbound vehicles. So uh, what's happened historically here is when left uh, turn vehicles are, are waiting in the lane to turn, it actually causes a queue, a backup into the crossing. So by eliminating that left turn altogether, uh, we'll eliminate that queue. So next steps, um, as mentioned, we're finalizing the, the concept design phase and the, the coordination phase. We'll be summarizing this in a final report for the city. And then the next phase again would be uh, actual final design permitting, uh, of course, funding and then construction. Um, you can see a breakdown of the uh, four different crossings there, uh, approximate cost for each. Um, and just the last two line items I'll just mention, um, there's, the risk method, which is basically takes an average um, risk assessment of all the crossings through the corridor to technically meet the quiet zone criteria by FRA, um, you would only need to upgrade Ravenswood and Oak Grove to meet that average risk that, uh, well, there's a train right there. So, <laughs> so you would only need to um, actually upgrade Ravenswood and Oak Grove to, to meet the minimum criteria for FRA for this corridor. Um, however, if you wanted to upgrade all four, uh, it would be that higher $8 million um, uh, for the supplemental safety measure method. And so just to, just to uh, wrap up, 
um, here. We did have four questions uh, for you in the staff report, which are uh, included in short form on this slide. So one is just to confirm that we should pursue a service agreement with Caltrain. Caltrain would be taking over the project essentially from here. It's their gates. So uh, they're not going to be all that interested in the city uh, doing design or construction work there. That's something that would be a Caltrain lead. Um, and we did start that process, although obviously that agreement would come back to you um, before it, it was executed. Um, and then a question about whether or not, um, as Peter was just describing, we should pursue all four uh, crossings or pursue just the two that we can get there through the risk uh, method. Um, and then a, a third uh, comment that's come up, or a third question um, that's come up uh, in, in other forums, which is uh, potentially uh, asking California High Speed Rail for uh, a commitment to reimburse for the cost. Um, so High Speed Rail, uh, when uh, if and when it eventually comes through the peninsula, uh, we'll have higher speed trains. We'll have to seal the corridor. Um, and so uh, we're asking if uh, you want us to prepare a letter, uh, potentially for your consideration, um, to ask them to to formally um, re, you know commit to reimbursement. And that that might be something that would make sense to do in partnership with others um, as well. So that's something that could be discussed. Um, and then the last question, um, as Peter mentioned, in Oak Grove, because of the issues of uh, folks backing up on uh, the railroad tracks, we are uh, proposing these uh, additional left turn restrictions and an extension of the median that's there and, and looking for your direction on that as well. Um, and with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you very much for that informative and brief presentation. Um, so colleagues, do you have any clarifying questions before we go on to public comment? Uh, Council Member Nash. What is the crossing, what are the crossing, new crossing panels that are described? Is that? Yeah, so the new crossing panels would be uh, essentially those precast concrete panels that are directly adjacent to the rails that you literally walk across or, or ride your bike across or drive across. So those concrete panels that align adjacent to the, the rail themselves, so. And the purpose is for safe passage? Safe passage that creates that ADA pathway across the tracks, right? And so oftentimes with these crossings for us to implement uh, the, the infrastructure required, we have to put in additional infrastructure that requires extension of those those panels so that you can uh, where the uh, pedestrians are going to cross. So, thank you. And one other question is, what is happening at the pedestrian crossing at the train station? There's no required improvements there for the quiet zone, so that would basically be left alone. Yeah. And do the trains need to sound their horn at train stations? The trains, it's by discretion, essentially by the operator, the engineer. So um, with the quiet zone, um, that would not necessarily pre totally prevent uh, a train horn when they approach the station. So if, if a train operator sees um, pedestrians at the platform uh, at their discretion, they may decide to do two quick horns. Uh, however, at night, if there's no pedestrians on the platform, they will not need to sound a horn. They're not required to either. And, and if I may, you know, so that's true anywhere in the corridor, right? They would sound their horns anytime they saw pedestrians likely or or others too close to the tracks or, or something like that. So, mm -hmm. but the, the likelihood is that in peak periods, you would still be hearing a certain amount of train horns, although far fewer than uh, we do today. Mm -hmm. My question is because um, a few years back when I was on the LPMG, I thought that I heard that train, the conductors must sound their horns at the train stations. So is it a requirement? No. I don't okay. believe very so. Good. We can double check that, but I don't believe so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Council Member Dorr with her hand raised. Thank you. Um, so generally online, I was looking at a data about the risks of driving across and around gates. I'm curious if we have any data from Menlo Park about how and if uh, that happens. And how often, uh, any numbers that can be provided if there are any. Thanks. Do, do you have a sense of that? I don't have off the top of my head. There is a FRA database. There is a crash history that can be um, that can be you know found for each crossing. Um, and crash history is a component of looking at um, you know the the risks of each crossing. 
So they, they do take that into account. Um, but is specific to cause, causes of, of crashes historically at any given crossing from a, a vehicle going around a gate. Um, that I don't know is in the FRA database, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I, I think our crash history that we know about from um, doesn't show that there have been um, people going the wrong way through the gates. Um, and, um, you know, my understanding of, um, to, or I think, or some of the understanding of this is that um, while, you know, the four quad gates are a like sort of the highest level other than closing the crossing of a supplemental safety measure. Um, in areas like ours where there's a lot of traffic, we don't, you know, at the crossings, we don't really see a lot of people trying to go the wrong way through um, through the gates. It's mm -hmm. not it's not a common mm -hmm. observation, um, it, it, you know, if, if it happens at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I appreciate the question, Council Member Dorr. I had a very similar question. So um, then nationally, you don't have data on how many train crashes are caused by people trying to swerve around or do you have any anecdotal thoughts about that? It could be. Um, uh, we're bringing, we have a, a partner online, um, Brent Ogden, who's actually... Um, uh, editor of the FHWA Grade Crossing Handbook. So he's a national expert on this. So we're going to bring him and see if he might have more input on that. I don't know of any actual, his, you know, national data, but Brent can maybe chime in and see if there if there is. Well, well, you know, we can get to um, information on gate drive around nationally, but um, from the point of view of Menlo Park, I mean, the FRA rules establish the conditions under which you can. Um, get relief from the quiet, from the uh, requirement to sound the horn. And the risk factors that are built into the FRA equations are based upon, you know, nas national data um, that actually, you know, captured with and without horn noise, uh, what the experiences were at crossings across the country. So I guess, you know, the, the, the answer is sort of that in the aggregate, there is a risk reduction factor that is there when you provide the four quadrant gates um, the reality is that the frequency of a fatal collision on a on a railroad crossing is pretty infrequent. So, um, you know, it, you're not likely to have, I mean, it's nothing like car collisions where you have them all the time. So um, it'd be very difficult to statistically say what the specific improvement was because the uh, frequencies of the collisions are rather low. But regardless of that, it is statistically safer. Mm -hmm. And and the way the FRA risk assessment is set up uh, with these crossings or any crossings across the country without doing the four quad gate system, it's not going to qualify for a, a, a quiet zone. So, and maybe just add one other piece of information to think about this. We're thinking about this in the context of a passenger railroad uh, in an urban area, urbanized area, right? But this also is considered for you know rural areas, freight trains, very different conditions. You might have you know mile long trains that are keeping crossing closed for very long periods of time. So it, there are a lot of different conditions to which it applies. And so you know it, it just we have to follow the national rules, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean that's important, but they don't necessarily uh, directly mirror what we we would be experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I'll just clarify my last statement, uh, four quad gates or we're putting medians, raised medians. And of course, as I mentioned though, putting in raised medians at these crossings is not a, a viable option, unfortunately. Thank you, I have another question. Um, when I was looking at Glenwood and Ensenol, um, it looks like we do have some flexible bollards um, on the north side of the tracks um because there aren't driveways there is that correct um so that would be helpful in preventing the swerving action on the side on the north side of the tracks on the south side of the tracks um is there with the driveways that are there are there any further mitigations if we end up pursuing two crossings to further deter even though there's a very, sounds like tiny likelihood of that swerving activity, but that we've kind of left no stone unturned of any mitigation we could further do too. Yeah, that. absolutely. 
Yeah, so there's one place where we could put a median closer to the tracks where, so, so about, about three or four years ago, I think um, Caltrain actually went in and put in a lot of the medians that are out there today. And as part of a sort of, they look at all their crossings and they just keep working through safety improvements at every crossing because it's a it's a certainly significant issue for them. Um, and they seek funding for that. And they tend to obviously go for the sort of most cost efficient thing. So there is one leg, I think, of um, Glenwood that there isn't a median that we could definitely right next to the tracks, a, a short piece of median that we could look at adding. And I think on Ensignal, I hope I have the, the right the one right um sort of doing this from memory. There is a driveway like a for local access that sort of um would inhibit you'd you'd be restricting that uh, one property to uh, write in, write on, out only um if we were to add a median there. So that'd be something we could obviously explore and and you know talk to the uh, property owner about if that was uh, desired. Thank you, Mr. Louch. Um any other questions? Yes, Councilmember Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Wilson. I, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So with the risk method, um, we're only doing Ravenswood and Oak Grove in connection with the park gates, and for the other crossings, we're doing nothing, right? And or in the, um, the then the the result is that then we would get the the quiet zone throughout the corridor. So so even for those those crossings, correct, correct right. yeah. for the entire 1.5 mile, give or take. Okay. Yep. Yeah because the risk is lower um as a whole for the corridor yep okay yeah um lower for those crossings are or, or what do you mean as the risk is lower on it is is, the, is it those is it something specific about those crossings right that is is why they we could get the the quiet zone across the corridor without putting the quad gates there yeah, so those two in particular have the highest risk for crashes. So that's why the you know mitigation measures or safety measures uh, infrastructure will be put in for those two, because um, the other two have less traffic, less historical crashes. Um, so as long as you get those two done out of the the four in the corridor, your average risk across the corridor would qualify for quiet zone. So now that doesn't mean you you don't have to just do two you know you can do yeah. four and, and and you know further increase the the safety index for the entire corridor obviously which would be great but yeah. all right so, and i would just and maybe this was in the south report and i i didn't see it be, because it came up yeah obviously um these um incidences are are very rare um we have over the past decade though had one uh, in menlo park at ravenswood that, that did result in, in in a death and so mm -hmm. i sure. just want to sort of acknowledge mm -hmm. that yeah, that's correct. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. Um, just pointing out that the it wasn't a result of swerving around. It was a a terrible situation, but it was a different circumstance then. Yeah, my only thing is it, it happened at, at at the crossing, and it was a, a train in a car. But yeah, say so it was it was not um, as a result of of the driver trying to to get around the the, the arm. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. Um, so I think we've had our opportunity to ask some initial clarifying questions, and now it would behoove us to go to public comment. So City Clerk Herring, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our study session item H1, provide direction on the Caltrain Quiet Zone Study, for those of you participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. For members of the public who are participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Okay, and our first speaker will be John Waddell, followed by Amy Mushlin. Hello, evening, Council. John Waddell, Menlo Park, and I just hopped off a of Caltrain. It was delayed probably about 40 minutes because they're trying to improve it, but uh, happy to see this council meeting and stop by and pleased to see this item. Um, I would say that I believe the folks who live along the corridor or are anywhere near the train deserve uh, a quiet zone. It's uh, the horns if you want to go hang out while the horns and the bells are going it's uh certainly impressive and so this is great but i would want to say that i certainly hope that 
we see this as an opportunity to take advantage of something to improve the quality of life in Menlo Park. But still, if there's an opportunity where someday in the future um, there's just a budget surplus and there's money for grade separations, we could see fully grade separating the train as an opportunity. I don't know uh, how many cars turn onto the tracks. People are using the GPS to turn the tracks or people are wanting the tracks or cement trucks accidentally drive and get stuck on the tracks. But I know the number for BART, which is zero because BART is fully grade separated. And, um, you know, there are trains that derail. So the idea of putting in a quiet zone isn't mitigating the potential of a catastrophe. And but with budgetary issues right now, we just can't do anything more. So I think this is great, but hopefully we can look towards the future and when there's an opportunity, future council can take advantage of that and fully grade separate Caltrain. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Amy Mushlin followed by Adrian Brad. Hi, I'm Amy Mushlin, and I'm speaking on behalf of many community members along the Cal Caltrain line from Park Forest to Linfield Oaks. Uh, many numerous uh, downtown businesses, including all the hotels and the restaurants that are my close neighbors, and also residents from across Menlo Park. Uh, you've heard directly from many of them. I think 41% of your comments this, uh, this year were from uh, folks around town calling in about this issue. Um, and I think that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are a lot of us here right along that corridor um, and, and many more coming on board soon. Um, first of all, we wish to thank the council and the staff and the consulting firm for the Quiet Zone Implementation Study. We're very uh, pleased to see that progress in a very uh, thorough and uh, well-designed study there. Um, and I am dialing in today to encourage you to continue to advance this project as pragmatically, aggressively, and creatively as possible um, by pursuing the service agreement with Caltrain and the other required next steps as outlined on by the uh, city staff. At this point, we know you're well-versed in the numerous benefits of quieting the train um, uh, that, that that will have on the livability health uh, of those of us who live, work, and shop in Central Menlo Park. So I'm not going to bore you with that, a repeat of that. Um, but what I would like to do is draw some direct lines between the implementation of the quiet zone and some of the city's new priorities as uh, articulated in the last meeting. The first is revitalizing downtown. I think increasingly downtown Menlo Park is along the quiet zone, is along the train tracks. And a quiet zone will bring improved vitality to the hotels uh, and the restaurants that, that line this, uh, the, the tracks and are not far from it. Uh, and that, of course, brings more uh, taxes and sales tax and occupancy tax to the city coffers. Second is housing. Uh, so much new housing is being built along these tracks, uh, and all of these residents are going to uh, be joining us soon in these city council meetings to advocate for this, and it will be an excellent benefit for them. The third is state safe streets. Um, both of the potential quiet zone solutions are safe. Uh, the Complete Streets Conditions uh, Commission endorsed them both uh, last week uh, with the two, two crossings or you know even with the four, but getting started with the two seems like a very pragmatic solution. Well, we believe that achieving a citywide quiet zone will bring numerous benefits to Menlo Park. And now that the implementation study is nearly complete, we are really excited to see it become even more of a major focus for the city uh, in the near future. Thank you so much for your time and uh, have a good night. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Adrian Brandt, followed by Roland. Good evening, council members. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join your meeting until about five minutes ago. So I'll just make some general comments. Um, I, I absolutely support the uh, incremental approach of doing the highest risk um, crossings, uh, Ravenswood and Oak Grove first, and then um, down the line uh, when when funding permits, um, you know, uh, you can look at doing the other two. But at last, at least that way, you get um, the quiet zone risk index down to where um, the entire uh, four crossings plus the uh, station pedestrian crossing are eligible, thereby creating a quiet zone 
uh, if Palo Alto does uh, Palo Alto Avenue, uh, it would run all the way from Churchill in Palo Alto to Chestnut Street in Redwood City. So that would create, because Atherton is in the process, I don't know if you covered this during your meeting, um, but Atherton is doing um, uh, the, the street by Holbrook Palmer Park, so that Watkins. So that one will be done, um, it's supposed to be done by the end of this year. Um, yeah, so the the comment, the, the other thing happily, I just wanted to share with you, um, I'm speaking on my own behalf and I'm a member of the Caltrain Citizens Advisory Committee, long time member um, and long time, uh, I grew up in Menlo Park and have been um, active with the train politically and otherwise for um, the better part of over 40 years. And um, I can tell you happily that Caltrain does not have a drive around problem, um, but nevertheless, the High Speed Rail Authority because of its speed is required to do, the, to do the sealed corridor, which means quad gates is coming out of their pocket anyway, as per their EIR. And so um, I do encourage you to work um, cooperatively and reasonably and see if you can um, work out a deal of reimburse, reimbursement because the authority will have to do quad gates anyway when it does arrive on the peninsula. And certainly doing them now is cheaper than doing um, um, whenever they actually get here, which is gonna be quite some time out. So. Um, and they, they did have a, a, a bucket of funds as part of Prop 1A for bookends projects. They funded um, about three quarters, uh, sorry, about a, a third of the Caltrain electrification out of that bucket of funds. And I believe they still have some of that left. Um, and that could very, very justifiably go toward um, other bookends projects such as Quiet Zone implementation or, or Quad Gates in Menlo Park and on other cities on the peninsula. Um, so to the to the point of it, it's important to realize that all the almost all the grade crossing accidents or crashes, if you will, more accurately, um, result from either suicide, just so they're intentional and not a safety issue, such as the one at Churchill that just happened, or a violation of vehicle code 22526D, which means you cannot start crossing legally a train crossing without there being enough room to get all the way across, and that's what happened uh, at Ravenswood. So thanks. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Roland, followed by Marcia Bramowitz. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roland O'Brien. I live in San Jose, and I may actually have been a member of the public that mentioned that Caltrain had to sound their horn when they approached the station. But, but this is not an FRA rule. This is a railroad operating rule known as rule 14M. So in this case, it's Caltrain have the rules, Union Pacific have their rules, and then one day there'll be other, maybe high-speed rail or capital corridor or other railroads. But that's the, they're the people who implement that, that rule, not the FRA. Um, the other uh, sound that will remain until the grade separate is if a train stops at Menlo Park, Caltrain has to sound its horn to lower the gate before proceeding. That's, that's another rule. Um, I believe they're using rule 14B, uh, which, which applies to a train um, departing a station. Now, my last comment um, has to do with, with quad gates, and that's a tough conversation to have with high speed rail. Uh, you obviously need quad gates for uh, quad zones, but high speed rail, or anybody else for that matter, does not require quad gates in the United States unless they intend to operate at speeds in excess of 90 miles an hour. So that concludes my comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Marcia Bramowitz, followed by Sally Cole. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marcia Bromowitz, and I represent the same constituents as Amy Mushlin and wish to build on her comments in support of moving forward on multiple fronts to achieve the quiet zones as expediently as possible. As a first step, we encourage you to pursue staff's recommendation to initiate a service agreement with Caltrain to advance the design work for all four crossings. With those designs in hand, it would be fantastic to upgrade all four as everyone has been talking about. Um, we would love that, um, but it's gonna be really hard to come up with $8.2 million. 
Um, four million is a lot too, but it's definitely more achievable in the short run. So if it turns out that the city can only afford to do two, we as a community um, that have been very involved in pursuing the quiet zone encourage you to consider this more pragmatic approach, which indeed, as was mentioned, fully meets the safety standards of the FRA. Um, as far as funding sources go, it's you know wonderful to hear Adrian Brandt share his thoughts. And um, we encourage the city to be as creative and out of the box in its exploration as possible. In addition to the funding sources that were highlight in, highlighted in staff's presentation, we encourage looking at other avenues. Um, one idea would be the ARPA funds, which we understand total $4 million and need to be spent on behalf of Menlo Park residents by the end of 2024. Um, a second avenue would be public benefit dollars that would be generated from new development, especially those near the train tracks like Park Line. Um, a third option would be exploring uh, some of the recent measures that have been approved by voters supporting local transit, and I I'm sure there are others. Um, last month in its presentation to the community, Kimley Horn stated that we need to line up all funding before quiet zone work can begin. So we really need to get going. And we just encourage the city to turn over every stone to amass the funds, $4 million or $8.2 million as quickly as possible. And as community members, we are willing and eager to help however we can. Please just ask, you, you know where to find us. Um, so in summary, it's incredibly exciting to see a quiet zone within reach. We are greatly appreciative of the collective efforts and support of council and staff and um, Kinley Horn who have gotten us to this point. And going forward, we ask you to please keep the momentum going and move ahead on multiple fronts simultaneously so we can quiet the horns and bring greater vibrancy and improve quality of life to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Sally Cole, followed by Adina Levin. Hello, uh, this is Sally Cole with the Complete Streets Commission. And last week we had the good fortune to review this work, uh, the background work that the city staff has done and also the consultant on the quiet zone that was heard tonight. and. We absolutely unanimously want to commend the city staff and the consultant for doing uh, such excellent analysis and presenting the options. Um, I have two things I want to say to the council. Um, first, I strongly support the quiet zone work, and I think it's entirely consistent and supportive of everything the council is doing right now to strengthen Menlo Park's quality of life and to advance its economic development. And I commend you for keeping those two priorities top of mind. Um, second, there's been a lot of discussion around whether you do two gates, you know, the ones obviously that have 75% of the traffic of the crossings, two crossings um, for the $4 million at first, or whether you do all four for $8 million. And I don't know if anyone's ever really asked the city council whether the $8 million is even possible. But having thought about it since our meeting last week for the past week, I would go forward to the council and recommend that I think it's a more fitting and equitable decision for Menlo Park to make to address all four crossings at once and add the quadrants to all four crossings at once. Even if some receive more traffic than others, it just simply makes more sense to me from a policy perspective to treat um, everyone in Menlo Park, no matter where they live across that whole line, uh, provide them the same level of safety and do it once right the first time at all four crossings. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. So next up is a Dean 11 followed by Jenny Michelle. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members, a Dean 11 Menlo Park resident and uh, wanted to support what uh, uh, many other speakers have been saying um, in support of the quiet zones to improve the quality of life of people who live near the tracks. Um, the um, I also wanted to um, echo what one of the speakers said in terms of uh, 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 quiet zones are good, but they do not uh, 
the uh, grade separations will eventually deliver many more benefits in terms of uh, safe and convenient cross town connectivity. So we don't in any way see quiet zones as a replacement for grade separations. However, grade separations are expensive projects that uh, will take an uh, undefined long time in order to get funded and implemented. Um, so uh, please move forward with these um, as quickly as feasible. Uh, work, uh, working with other cities to get letters to high-speed rail for eventual reimbursement um, is good, but however, the timing such that high-speed rail might have funding to reimburse is also really undefined, so I wouldn't really count on it. And um, in any predictable uh, time, um, liked what uh, some previous speakers said in terms of really uh, creatively looking for funding sources to fund this project, um, you know, including uh, considering the earmark uh, sources of funding that have been successful in the past. Um, and, um, you know, I do think having uh, four would be best. And while I, I do feel as an individual a little bit uh, anxious at having you know, somewhat less protection if we do two streets uh, first. Um, uh, I, I think that um, it seems like the relatively lower safety risk and the drive around problems may be worth taking that additional risk. Um, at any rate, um, in general support of the quad gates, including uh, moving forward with them, and uh, looking for creative ways to get some funded. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Jenny Michelle, and this will be the final call for public comment on our study session item H1. Uh, hello, good evening, dear mayor, vice mayor, Council members, staff, neighbors, members of the public. My name is Jenny Michelle from the Coleman Place Neighborhood Block, um, longtime renting resident on Willow Road, mother of IEP student, and by trade a commercial property manager, former recovering um, homeless teacher. Um, I'm also a Judy Heron fan club member, and I'm bringing you tales from the leveraged labor crypt. Um, I really appreciate and applaud the mobilization of neighbors and all the concerns voiced. Um, and unfortunately, I offer my views tonight from lived experience as a counterpoint to provide a perspective not commonly voiced in these meetings. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to um, attend the other meetings. Um, so I'm a survivor of chronic assault and abuse having grown up here in these streets. Um, and I've struggled with suicidal ideation. And I, I actually do fully support ho horns. Like it or not, they've helped keep me alive all these years. The horns are intended to keep the traffic and residents safe and they work as designed and intended. So my question is why amend the system? Um, our son is nine years old and he's obsessed with all things trains, especially Caltrain. And because of his deaf and hard of hearing disability, the, the sound of the train is actually a source of comfort, an anchor, a reminder, and he feels the vibration. It is truly a special experience for him that he loves and looks forward to. For me, when I hear the sound of the horn, I hear my workforce working hard to help ensure landlord meet their legal obligations to tenants and to municipal municipalities being vibrant. And so I, I've, I do support grade separation. My concern is that relative to our city priorities, um, that this is actually low on the list. Um, and we could do a lot with the 4 million or the 8 million for our other priorities. And this could be pushed um, down the line. Um, so again, I'm not, I, I wish I didn't have this lived experience. Um, and unfortunately I do, 
Um, and again, I applaud all the staff and the consultants work. You guys are amazing. We live in a world-class municipality um, and I truly value your time and energy. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mayor Willison, seeing no fourth further hands or cards, you may continue. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, City Clerk Heron. Um, thank you, Ms. Michelle, and thank you to all of the speakers um, who shared uh, what this means to them. Um, I do want to point out that um, this is not the first time we've talked about quiet zones. And right now, um, those of us on the dais are looking at an empty chambers. Um, I do want to point out that having talked to some of the community leaders um, prior to this evening, they um, elected, a lot of the ones in support of the quiet zone elected to have just a couple folks speak um, with the knowledge that um, most of us, with the exception of Council Member Door, have um, had the benefit of hearing many, many, many stories, received many emails, and had many testimonies of um, all of the support and benefits. So I just want to let folks know that um, I was um, in conversation with some of those community leaders and supported not having them come out in mass and give three hours of public comment. So I just wanted to frame that there is um, that. Uh, Ms. Obramowitz and um, others, I feel like, speak for many people, um, not at all to belittle um, some of the other comments that we heard that might have a different opinion. I also want to point out a comment that was made at the Complete Streets Commission by Mr. Ezio um, Alventi, um, who is um, hearing, imp no, sight impaired, excuse me, um, who gave a very interesting perspective about the horn noise actually hindering his ability to hear other dangers in the environment, particularly car sounds. And so um, there are many different perspectives for us to consider. And I just want um, members of the public to know that we um, enter this conversation very, um, knowing that this is a, a heavy decision, knowing that lives potentially are on the line regardless of what we choose to do. And so we, we don't um, discuss this lightly. Um, with that being said, um, I'd like to see if any of my colleagues, actually, um, City Clerk Karen, can you please put up the slide of the feedback or um, Mr. Louch that staff is seeking this evening? So. Um, I, we do have four things um, we need to make a decision. I think the first is, um, will become obvious um, if we decide that we want to move forward. Um, but I, we don't have to keep this up this whole time, but we'll return to this at the end to make sure we've covered all four. And with that, I want to um, open up the discussion to anyone who'd like to kick it off. Council Member Combs. Yeah, so the, the first is, um... First, I'd like to say it was great great to hear from the, the public comments, especially um, people like Roland and Adrian, who I've considered train experts and recall my my days on the the rail subcommittee. Um, so it's good to hear those uh, all voices, but but good to hear those uh, familiar voices um, again, who I know are are experts on the uh, peninsula and, and and down into the valley when it comes to rail issues. So they're. And this is something that uh, Roland mentioned that has been my concern, and I think uh, Councilmember Nash touched on th th that. Evers is understanding one that, like leaving the train station, there there was some sort of requirement that of of a horn being blown, and so um, and so I, I think that like we, we I, I certainly need some clarity on on that, and that too that irrespective of what like um, the Federal Rail Administration, their rules are for quiet zones, that, that it is the operators who ultimately have the final say um, and determination in whether they want to blow their horns or not. And so it would be great uh, to have some, if, if staff of the consultant could offer some, some clarity um, uh, on, on those issues. And then, and then I, ha I, have, I have a couple others, <laughs> but first, uh, yeah. if you could weigh in, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Combs. Let me, let me start. So, um, there are 
like FRA requirements. So there's no FRA requirement that they blow their mm-hmm. horns. And then there's Caltrain operating procedure. And there, are, and I think uh, definitely I've, I've heard Roland speak quite a few times in many different <laughs> venues and super knowledgeable uh, and informed about, about things rail. Um, and so, yeah, I think he, he clearly knows the specific rules even that uh, are, are, that they use at the, at the operating railroad. Um, and uh, so a couple of things. So yes, they do, uh, they would sound horns likely. And again, it's, there is discretion about when they use the horns uh, coming into the station. And it has to do with, um, as I understand it, the, um, you know, essentially the presence of people on the platform and where they are. It's basically, they're considering the safety of the people mm-hmm. on the platform. So I don't think there would ever be a time when there would be literally no horns sounded uh, for the, that specific platforming issue. Um, and then the triggering of the horns exiting the station, they are in the middle of changing. So we, I think we need to talk to Caltrain about this a little bit. They're in the middle of changing their uh, system for the um, for their signals and their gates. And then it's going to operate a little bit differently in the future um, than it is today. In fact, some of the weekend closures that are happening right now are associated with some of those changes. So um, we can dig into that a little bit more to see if there's still that like that one quick horn to trigger the gates lowering um, if that's required. Um, and then the other thing about um, their discretion. So yes, anytime they believe there to be an unsafe situation, the engineer has the discretion to blow, still use the horns. The quiet zone only doesn't require horns. It doesn't guarantee there will be no horns. Um, and uh, we did hear, I think, from someone at our public um, uh, meeting for this project about, you know, when Atherton, because Atherton does have a quiet mm-hmm. zone now, and when they first did, um, the engineers ignored it, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, some complaints were brought, and, and they have since kind of adjusted uh, their behavior. So, um they, you know, there is, they will, there still will be horns, but they would be substantially less frequent and not the 16, you know, yeah. horn sounds all the way down the corridor. So I do think in, in, I guess, as, as we, we talk about that, that's an important distinction again, because after and obviously have no station anymore. And so um, what we're offering is not a quiet zone, but a less loud zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I do think that that's, that's important, like right, um, um, to, to to that that we 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 understand that. Um, it is interesting in, in one of the public comments, someone said the issue about sort of uh, mentioned the, uh, the the phrase equitable, and 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 for me that that leads into how else I want to sort of explore and, and look at this. And so I want to understand that, like, let's just start with like the eight point two million, like what what is in that is that just construction costs is that like um is, is that all consulting costs design costs is, is that like all in um i know it doesn't include city staff time but uh i, I want to get some understanding like what that number represents yeah so that number has built in um contingency um it has built in cost escalation for estimated time of construction which would be a couple of years out um, uh, estimated cost of labor for construction for this area, and um, pardon me, and design. Yeah. Okay, so it does include design, and so and since. Oh, excuse me. I thought yeah. the design was an additional three point five to a million. The staff report. Yeah, in, in the staff report, we called out what the sort of near term cost would be for design, but but it is included in that total. So apologies oh. if that wasn't clear. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, yeah, so t- totally cool. And so then, um, since the um, the 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 sort of agency of record on this project is is Caltrain, like like how does it it work? Do we write them checks like right over the course of 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 um of this this period? Do we do we have to like go all in initially, and and sort of um provide them the fees uh, up front, it'd be good to, to understand a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think what might be instructive is sort of the way the middle undercrossing is working. So when we have small, when we had some small like review tasks, we had to pay them up front. 
but now that we're into sort of um, them completing final design and, and doing some other things for that, you know, we get invoice quarterly for the actual work completed, or we will be. That was the last agreement that um, that you all um, agreed to with them, which is in the process of being executed. So it, 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 we wouldn't have to pay, we wouldn't have to find $4 million and, and put it on the table um, to do this. So, you know, we would first for the design phase likely be billed incrementally. And then for construction, we'd have to have the money in hand essentially to be able to do it, you know, but um, we wouldn't be paying for it all. Okay. Um, and then just one more comment and then, then I'll, I'll, I'll um, to turn over to, to the rest of council. So I, I have to admit, like I'm, I, I wrestle w with this um, and going back to that, that issue of, of equitability um, because when when I first talked to some time ago, um, the advocates of this, we were talking in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I very much remember them saying that. Um, and 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 because I was like, I don't think you're you're being serious. And like, no, Drew, no, we're we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of project. This is not millions of dollars. And I I know exactly uh, one of the proponents of this effort saying that. And so here, some years later. I'm looking at an eight million dollar project, and so, and so this is what concerns me because this, as has been pointed out, has never been sketched out as part of the city's priorities or goals. Um, it came up in result of 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 resident um, uh, resident advocacy, and I think that that's valid, right? But it 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 is. I think it's valid if you're talking about like a six hundred thousand dollar project. Um, but then at some point, if you're talking about an $8.2 million project, at some point, I, th I think we have to ask ourselves, like, how does this fit into those larger goals? And is this equitable? Like, right, is this an equitable distribution of the limited and finite resources of the city as it relates to staff time and, and as it relates to, to, to money? And so I think for me, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with. Again, I've been very much a supporter of this, very much understanding that it, it's a, a, va a quality of life um issue but uh, uh that's before i see i saw 8.2 8 million million dollars as, as a cost and so that's what i'm wrestling with and i'm hoping my colleagues will, will help me to get to some 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 conclusion that that i can feel comfortable with this this evening thank you council member combs um vice mayor taylor did you want to speak I can wait until other council members do, but I'm on the same page as council member Combs. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, council member Dorr, what are your thoughts? Yeah, could I, so a question that comes up uh, and someone spoke to this as well, um, is about grade separation and when, when we are moving that forward and how anything we're doing now is going to be torn up because we'll have a grade separation. Um, I know that's in the, the future, but could I have, the year again for when that work will begin. Uh, so um, I can do my best to, to provide you uh, an answer. Unfortunately, it's not, there's no specific year, I would say. So where we are right now is that we have direction on a preferred grade separation concept. We are working with Caltrain uh, to start eventually a service agreement to do the next phase of that, which is just the environmental uh, phase. And then we would be into design uh, phase for that. And then we would have to find somewhere between 500 and $800 million at current uh, numbers, uh, call it a billion, right, uh, to, to do grade separation. Um, and so um, 10 to 20 years from now. Got it. Thank you. Uh, another question I have is, in these uh, descriptions of what each crossing needs, it seems that even the side that already has uh, a barrier would need to be redone. And I'm curious if there's any alternative scenario where we just keep the existing crossing on this side and on the other side, I, I just add one new one as opposed to both sides. Yeah, a great question. Um, we would love to be able to do that, but um, uh, new standards um, would uh, require the replacement of them. Caltrain will require that, unfortunately. Even if it's not uh, just a slight modification, they'll require the full replacement of the the, uh, the gate assembly, so. Great, thank you. And I remember there was, uh, there's a pr the 
federal section 130 program with that has funds to eliminate hazards at existing grade railroad crossings. They had 16 million for projects statewide. Uh, how likely is it that we could get something like that to support this project? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's possible that folks from Kimmy may have a sense of this as well. So there is like a the state essentially has a goes looks at all the crossings and has a um ranking essentially of the of the kind of risk uh, of those crossings. And as agencies apply and Caltrain is a regular applicant. In fact, I believe Section 130 fund may have been what have paid for some of the median um improvements already. Um so you know cost effectiveness is going to be a cat uh, um uh of you know a feature of of that program and so lower cost things that have reasonable benefit are are more likely to be funded um my understanding however is that at least one other city in the peninsula may have received funding uh to support some of this type of work uh through that program so we're looking into that um and um certainly think it's possible but i wouldn't count on it you know, as paying for, you know, 100% of the costs uh, in, in all likelihood. But I, I do think it could very well be a, a contributor. And it's going to be more of a contributor at a higher risk crossing, obviously. So again, as we think about prioritizing, uh, you know, where we seek for funding, as we do for any grant source, right? Ravenswood's going to be the one that's most likely to be able to get that funding, um, just because of the, uh, you know, past history of collisions, and then the amount of traffic and all the other risk factors that go into that. Great, I really appreciate hearing that. And um, that also gives me more peace to, to share my, my thoughts and my hopes for this. Um, folks have been advocating for a long time. I know that I've been newer in those conversations, but I appreciate all the years of, of organizing and conversations, sorry, there's a bug, um, to address and create a quiet zone. I would feel comfortable moving with, forward with the two highest risk uh, projects and do all we can to try to get reimbursements through the other program, through the, the letter that was on the um, slide as well. Um, and then as resources uh, might avail themselves explore the other two but also in hopes that the grade separation can be moved forward i'd feel comfortable just focusing on the two highest risk options thank you thank you council member door uh council member nash you're up so first of all i guess on the section 130 is that was 16 million for the entire state I think that's correct. I think that's what's in the staff report. Um, that's what, on an right. annual basis. Yeah. Okay, so this would be it. it is virtually all impossible all. that we would get all of it. Correct of the funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question is: Is it would, and perhaps you mentioned this that you thought another city was um, had got had been successful, but would that possibly be for quiet zones, or is that just? So to be clear, we wouldn't be applying uh, to get funding for a quiet zone. We'd be applying to get funding for four quadrant gates to improve the safety of the crossings. All perspective. Thank you. Okay. Um, on the um, does with this cover, what happens with freight horns at night? One of the things that I hear a mile and a half away is freight horns. Would what is the situation there? Uh, same situation. So there's a quiet zone that's recently been implemented in San Jose, which the, the primary operator is UPRR, and it's uh, they will not sound the horns through that corridor. So, And so that's the same? Yeah, same. So correct. So they were not required with the quiet zone, the UPRR will not, yeah, sound the horns, you know, if measures are implemented for the quiet zone. So, and I did want to mention um, UPRR as a stakeholder was involved and they were invited to the field diagnostic meeting. They did not attend, but um, the improvements that are proposed here are in line with their, their standards as well. So we do follow those. And, and maybe just to be really specifically clear, right? Like they still follow the FRA rules, right? They don't, they, they do. don't get to make their own rules, even though if you talk to railroads, generally they tell you that they like to think they do, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
any idea if Palo Alto is going to pursue their median extension? Because that's something that even though it's in Palo Alto, it has a significant sound noise for Menlo Park residents. Uh, yes, that is my understanding. They are going to continue um, independently to put in that median improvements to to at least get that portion of a quiet zone implemented because it is uh, obviously a much less cost so um, to, to implement and it would be fairly quick as well. So. Thank you. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know if you'll have an answer to this, but I'm curious about city liability insurance in each of the scenarios. First, um, existing the two scenarios, two gates and four gates. Yeah, maybe I um, can speak to that to start. And then if our city attorney wants to correct me on anything, um, <laughs> that may be necessary as well. But, um, you know, we did, I know this question came up, I think at the very beginning um, of the study and, you know, our understanding is that there's been some research into this and that there's no, nothing specific uh, that leads us to believe that there would be, um, but that it's certainly one of those, it, one of those things where risk would be assessed and, you know, that there could be a cost, but I, we don't have any estimate of like a specific cost that would be associated with that. Do we have any idea from Atherton? Uh, we don't, um, although I will uh, reach out to them and, and inquire to see if there's been any um, cost associated with it. Thank you. Um, so I, when I first read the staff report and was talking to people, I was um, very much in favor of the four zones, um, four crossings. Um, it didn't... Um, but it basically, I have evolved so that after listening to um, discussions, um, talking with our city manager helped a lot. And um, just going through the scenarios, I actually am comfortable with two because essentially it's just the same as we have now. Um, we still have the crossing, so it still would take some intention to go around the gates. Um, okay. So I am... Um, I share the concerns about the cost of the project. I hesitate to make decisions right now with the budget coming up and not really having much idea other than it's gonna be a belt tightening year. Um, so I actually would prefer to be making this decision after seeing the budget rather than right now. Um, And I am concerned about um, even the four million. I would like to um, have some sort of um, perspective as to whether or not assessment districts would work. I know that there's a level at which um, it just the administrative fees and the effort involved doesn't make sense. And I heard that this was probably around a threshold which um, it may make sense, but it may not. Do the I would like to see if there's any, um, how we could fund this. So I think that that's a um, way to go. And so I am for the um, project proceeding, depending on our budget, and also depending on what the actual expectation is for train noise um, and liability insurance, just how much are the costs and what is the real, benefit, but overall, um, I think it would be a tremendous improvement in people's quality of life. Thank you. And thank you for all the work. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Um, okay, I'll go and then I'll let my colleagues uh, have a chance to speak again. Oh, Council Member Dorr. Oh, I just, I wanted to follow up on that question uh, from Council Member Nash about uh, the timeliness of making this decision. And I know our conversations on budget are coming up in June, which are just a few council, council meetings away. Um, is there a timeliness hope or need to have this uh, decision made at this moment? Or is that something that can be explored during the budget conversation? Yeah, maybe thank you for that question. Maybe just to clarify, I think what we're looking for is, do you want us to come at budget time i.e. next month and <laughs> bring this as a potential item for funding, recognizing that not looking for specifically, we'll fund this today. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, so I'm actually gonna kick it off with following up on a question from Council Member Dorr. So um, 
what is the likelihood of there being, well, other grant money for this project, whether that be federal, state, county, um, versus having to have it come out of the general fund or some other typical like city source? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I have a definitive answer for you tonight. Um, again, we're just kind of, we're guessing a little bit, right, in terms of what funding um, might possibly be available from other sort of external sources. Um, I, you know, like to be confident about this. We, we've had some success on other kinds of grants um, as well. Um, and someone did mention, you know, we have had also recent success on, um, you know, getting an earmark. Uh, in federal legislation for a project. So that's also an avenue that that could be pursued if consuming that they kind of continue the process as they have over the last couple of budget cycles. Um, so th those are things that, you know, again, I think with your direction is are things we could potentially pursue. Um, I, I feel like for one crossing, getting some amount of Section 130 funds feels achievable, but I, I don't know. I haven't applied on a grant to that program, so I don't... Um, uh, have necessarily anything to base that on. I think we'd want to do a little more research, which we have started doing, and then kind of come back with that. Um, and then, you know, the, I think the assessment district question is an interesting one and, and one that um, as staff we can pursue further to see if that's uh, a realistic option uh, to help maybe contribute to funding. My guess is like any big high cost item, like we're going to need funding from a bunch of different places. So, you know, we'll, we'll try to put that all together um, if we sort of have that direction to proceed. Thank you. And um, just to let my colleagues know, um, I did reach out to Congresswoman Ashu's office who wrote a letter of support of this project in 2021 for it to be included in a council priority um, and let that her office know about the meeting taking place tonight. And I will be updating her office on what transpires, um, not to put pressure on Congresswoman Ashu, but um, just wanted folks to know that I think we're trying to pick up every stone. Um, do you know, and I didn't ask this ahead of time, so I have a feeling the answer is no, you don't know, but approximately, um, and this might be more for community development, um, how many housing units are within, you know, half mile of the tracks? Um, Cause my sense is when we, when we look of like a benefit to, you know, a very small part of the city, versus a benefit you know, to the whole city or to a larger part of the city. Um, I feel like we have a concentration kind of along the train tracks, especially given our housing element um, opportunity sites clustering kind of in that area. So um, it might be something in the future if you don't have a number off the top of your head, but if you've looked at that at all. You're right. I don't have the number off the top of my head. <laughs> and yes, we could look at it. I'll just look over it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Nash wants to follow up on that. One thing that I forgot to mention as far as the assessment district possibility goes is I would love to see um, us go after the, it, the high speed rail. For, and if we do get funding, be able to reimburse the folks in the um, assessment district, if it were to go that way. That'd be administratively fun, I bet. <laughs> uh, Council Member Combs had a follow-up. Yeah, just along those lines. Um, th there is a downtown specific uh, plan amenity fund, right? Is Could that, there's some money in there, isn't there? Could, could that be used for, for, for this? Uh, let's see, I think through, through the mayor, I see the, uh, I'm being looked at for that. Do you want me re to respond? Yeah, great. Yeah, so I, I do, would believe it's an eligible fund and as part of um, any sort of uh, follow-up on the counts for the for, for this item, we can identify uh, funds like that that could be eligible. How much How much money is in that? Do we know? It's uh, over $2 million. Okay. Which could also, though, be used for the, the undercrossing, correct? Which is in for or, uh, the, the 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 undercrossing because the, the, that's not fully funded or has that been fully funded yeah i can respond to that okay. so sorry um, I, we have um secured quite a bit of funding recently for that 
Um, we, as we make updates to deal with, um, you know, sort of coordination with Caltrain and building in an electrified environment, we anticipate some cost increase, but we don't know how much yet. So, so the answer is probably not fully funded, but we're not exactly sure by how much. I do know that um, there is an, I think it's a new fund or a, something where we put $300,000 from Springline in dedicated to the quiet zone. Uh, through the mayor, uh, it's, it's in the same fund. And so that's when I said more than $2 million, it's incorporating that. Um, I, I do want to just make a point that we do need to kind of pull up probably the slides of the remaining items to be able to kind of um, bring this item to conclusion so we can work through the other items on the agenda this evening. We still have not gotten to the consent calendar, for example. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. Uh, on that, do you need to say something? Okay. I'm sorry, I have to say something. I see the downtown fund as something that would be benefit downtown and um, vibrancy there. And um, just, I'm sorry, I'm losing the word, but basically enhancing downtown as opposed to railroad crossings. Okay. Which so, I know is up for further debate later. Okay. I'm going to continue on my thing. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so I'm interested in um, the two options to begin with. I share a lot of the concerns about the safety elements, but given um, what we've heard tonight, um, the infrequency of the swerve around, that kind of not being the issue, as Mr. Brandt said, of collisions, um, and the fact that any risk associated with that has to be weighed against the long-term impacts of sleep deprivation, noise for hearing, stress for those living along the corridor. Um, I'm okay with the two. Um, I would like to see any additional examination of that flexible bollard or uh, extended median if possible, just to kind of let us sleep at night a little bit better that we've done everything we can. I'm also interested in, um, I know in Palo Alto, they have signs up at the crossings about suicide um, help. Um, I don't know if that is welcomed by the mental health, you know, the suicide advocacy community or not, but I would encourage, I don't think we have those signs up. We do. I, I believe that there are some, but but we can verify okay. that, and they are. I would welcome. before throwing them up. I would engage with um, an advocacy organization if that's a positive thing or not for them to have up. Um, and uh, I do think that um, you know I I actually struggled with this. I mean, I there's a lot of things I care about in the city. You know, housing, transportation, climate action. How does this fit in? Um, but I can't forget the years of testimony we've heard of all of the people, doctors, um, people begging us for some relief. And I hear it from my house. Um, I think this is, there's a lot of people in the city impacted by this. Um, so what I would like to see in the budget um, conversation moving forward is um, assuming like to put that, put this in there and then us having the opportunity to take it out um, if, if needed. So that's my um, proposed direction. So um, let, let's just walk through each of these and see where we're at um, with consensus wise. Um, so it's sounding like at least three of us are interested in pursuing an agreement. Um, I heard that from council member Nash, myself and council member Dorr, vice mayor Taylor or council member Combs. Do you wanna say anything about just moving forward at all? Um, yeah, um, taking into account the admonition from the, the city manager about the need to move, move on. Um, um, I, I will say that there is, I, I don't know, like every Tuesday night, a large plane that flies over my house. <laughs> and so on its way. But if you could do something about it. <laughs> so, I mean, part of this is the, the train was there before all of us. <laughs> and as that flight pattern SFO was there before I, I moved myself where I moved myself. Um, that's all they say. Yeah, I'm very, I'm supportive of, of the direction provided by, by, by the mayor and council member door. Okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to say, Vice Mayor Taylor? No, thank you. Okay. So, um, then we're looking at pursuing four quadrant gates, at two crossing, um, a two crossings. So I heard comfort from again, three of us to go ahead with the 
the bargain option. <laughs> um, and so I believe there was a, a follow-up question though about whether you should pursue design for all four. There's a slight incremental cost to do the design work. Correct. Um, so I'm comfortable with the design work for all four. Although does it expire? I remember the, hearing something. The design itself wouldn't expire. I think what you might have heard at the public meeting was that if we start the process but aren't ready to go to construction with a certain amount of time, we'd have to restart the process. That is the going through CPUC, but that doesn't mean that the designs would expire. The designs are, are going to last. Now, if rules change, then we might have to update the design at some point, but you know, four quadrant grades have been around for a long time. So, so actually, um, given that this is going to be budget placeholders, would we be able to see the different, the options for the budget? Sure. Um, so yeah, what, it I would think, be about double for to do all four because the, the okay. design work isn't going to vary that much by crossing. So okay. it's about twice as much to do all four. Because that's what now. we need to put in the 23-24 budget is Correct. for the design work. Yes. And so, it could be spread over multiple years potentially if, okay. if desired. Um, Council Member Nash? Isn't Encinal um, going to be a grade level crossing anyway? We're not planning to do grade separation there. So it seems like it might be worthwhile doing the design work for that one. Yeah, so that, that one, that's the plan, the adopted preferred alternative for grade separation has that as a grade separated crossing. I do remember hearing that the standards might change. Oh, but that's for quiet zone. So would the do we run the risk of designing something that becomes obsolete by the time we implement it? So if we if we design, I think you're very four, low risk of okay. it being obsolete. Okay. For, as again, four okay. question gates. And I apologize. I said grade separated. It's getting late. I meant at grade crossing, which is you looked at me like I yes. So you're correct. Okay. <laughs> so so it just when the budget comes forward. Um, I'd like there to just be like a call out of the two options, um, and then we can see how the budget's going at that point. Um, okay, is everyone okay with that? Okay, so letter, I think we're all in favor of seeking funding wherever we can get it. So aggressive letters about 130, about reimbursing high-speed rail, up to every nook and cranny we can find. Um, and following up on Ms. Abramowitz's comments, if staff feels that residents can be helpful or that the finance and audit committee can be helpful or any resource. But if you feel like that's going to hinder you, then by all means to your discretion. Um, okay. Ooh, we didn't get to the left turn restrictions. Is that something we need to discuss right now or something we can, um, okay. I'm seeing a thumbs up, a thumbs up. I'm a thumbs up as part of it. Council member door has got a thumbs up and okay. We all want the left. Oh, that was awesome. Okay. All right, I think we gave you everything you needed, uh, Mr. Louch. Um, I think you did. Okay, uh, I see Council Member Doerr. Is there anything you'd like to say? Just to affirm on the last one that that would be in conversation with community members along that corridor. Right, there's going to be some additional outreach. Correct. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so thank you for everyone who um, has been leading on this and for staff and my colleagues. And we are moving on at 9.41 to the consent calendar. Um, and under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Karen, can you please provide an update to F5? My apologies, Mayor Willison, that might have been a holdover. I okay. do not have an update at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so City Clerk Karen, can you please, I know we have two items that council members would like to discuss and pull, but I think at this time we will call for public comment on all consent calendar items. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of our consent calendar items, I1, updating the City Council subcommittee appointments, I-2, a resolution certifying compliance with the state housing laws for the OBEG-3 Middle Avenue Caltrain Crossing Project Grant. I-3, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement for the Bellhaven Joint Use, a Bellhaven School Joint Use Agreement. I-4, receive and file the single audit report for fiscal year June 30, 2022. 
or I-5, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement for legal services related to human resources. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Adina Levin. And Adina, if you could let us know which item you are speaking on. Uh, excuse me. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and City Clerk. I am speaking about the um, uh, OBAG related item. And okay. sorry, I did not uh, uh, catch which one that is, but that should be identifiable. And um, unfortunately, about uh, this one, I, I did a little bit of uh, homework over the last. Uh, day or so about the uh, MTC and um, what I found is that um, unfortunately uh, uh, Walnut Creek had tried to use the same um, self-certification in order to qualify but the MTC criteria requires HCD certification um, and I, I found this out from a Walnut Creek resident where they, uh, where this was a strategy that was attempted. Um, the good news is that in the MTC rules, um, it says that the certification is needed by December, 2023, um, which if I'm uh, remembering uh, correctly from the staff report about the housing element timeline, um, I think we should be able to attain. Um, so um, uh, uh, this is just uh, more encouragement to the city to pursue with all the needed steps in order to get the city a certified housing element by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Pam Jones. And this will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items. And Pam, if you can let us know which item you are speaking on. Um, yes, I'm speaking on item I-3. Thank you. Yeah, Pam Jones, uh, resident of uh, District 1. And I was hoping that the Ravenswood City School District was doing some kind of presentation so I would have a better understanding of this um, health clinic that they plan on putting as one of the options of putting it on the pl uh, play playing field. Um, and that also made me think of, well, what about the clinic at Menlo Uptown? Because the last time thing I remember about it from 2021 is that it was going to be a part of what is now being built for um, Menlo Uptown. And um, so it, I would, I really think it's important to have an understanding of what the options are that the Ravenswood City School District is asking us to, um, uh, uh, you know, express our opinion in a survey. And it's hard to answer that if we don't know what's happening with Uptown. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. See no other hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, so uh, before going on to the council, um, City Manager Murphy, we had um, two very interesting public comments. Um, one from uh, Ms. Levin uh, regarding eligibility for the OBAG grant dependent on housing element state certification um, and whether you know anything about that. So I, I can speak to that. Um, the um, So two separate things I think are, are being discussed here, one of which is housing element certification, which is this is not, uh, but and the other of which is for this specific grant that we got um, $5 million to support the middle under crossing, certifying that we will comply with state housing laws. Um, and that has to be delivered back to MTC by May. Um, and so that's what that resolution is saying, is that you certify that we will comply with housing laws now and forevermore, uh, essentially. So um, if 
we don't certify, or if you don't certify that that commitment to comply with housing laws, then we do have to forego that $5 million uh, in funding. And it is not associated with then some, the future certification of the housing element, although um, obviously there's eventually a relationship between those things. I'm a little confused. Um, so the resolution that we're approving that promises that we're going to follow housing element law is a catch-all that it could come to a point where we're not seen by the state as having complying with state law? So it's not housing element law specifically. It's a number of specific housing. So it's the Surplus Lands Act. I'm not, and I don't have it right in front of me, but there's a couple specific laws that are, that the state has that require compliance. And then it requires reporting of any um, uh, sort of uh, complaints or a variety, they have a variety of specific legal Okay, terms. so staff feels confident that this money is not at risk. Yeah, no, okay. well, if if you were to not uh adopt the resolution tonight the money would be at risk okay, okay. um but okay. otherwise no thank you we'll follow up later um and then the question from ms jones um are there any updates on menlo uptown and the community amenity that was being proposed with that project of the clinic uh let's see i can give a a, a brief update um regarding it and happy to, to follow up uh, subsequently. So um, without having all the uh, specifics in front of me right this second, um, I believe that um, one of the, the main sort of um, uh, clinic uh, identified for Menlo Uptown, I think the, it, it calls for a, um, a nonprofit uh, urgent care health, health clinic. I may not have the exact language in front of me um, but through the process, the, uh, the identified operator uh, was uh, Ravenswood Health Clinic. They did go through the process of looking at the specific site and uh, determined that they were, um, it was not going to meet their needs. So yeah, Ravenswood Health Clinic did notify um, the applicant and the, and the city staff that they were not interested in that site. So then the applicant is... Uh, pursuing other potential options, and uh, they have not yet uh, come to a conclusion on that. So it's um, in terms of specifically Ravenswood Health Clinic, they will, uh, based off their um, CEO, executive director, um, they are not in board, they are not um, going to be occupying the um, Menlo Uptown um, location. So there may or may not be a clinic associated with Menlo Uptown, because if they do not that, yeah, the, successfully pursue a clinic, then they can pay the in-lieu fee. Um, uh, yeah, there's a number of other steps specific to the, their community amenities okay. requirement. I, I think the key thing is that Ravenswood Health Clinic is not going to occupy okay. um, the uh, Menlo Uptown site. That That's the part that is definitive. Okay, yeah. thank you. I see Vice Mayor Taylor, did you want to say something? Oh, well, I wanted to add to this that um, one thing that would be helpful, um, and I appreciate this coming up in the public comment, is if Ravenswood School District would be a little more detailed with their options um, in their survey, which makes this a little, it, it doesn't make it necessarily confusing, but if folks know that there's not going to be an urgent care, or at least not Ravenswood Health Clinic providing urgent care in the Uptown Menlo property, Ravenswood reached out to Ravenswood, Ravenswood School District reached out to Ravenswood Healthcare Network about providing services on the Bellhaven Elementary School site. I have not, <clears throat> excuse me, I have not attended any of the school district meetings, so I don't know how much details have been shared. Um, I guess depending on which option, option one, two, or three that folks choose, that's what Ravenswood School District will go with. If not enough people choose option three, which I'm making that up, is the option for the clinic, then the clinic will not be on the site, which means there won't be a clinic at all. So, so yeah, that's all that I know. Okay, thank you. Sounds like we need to have a little more communication and coordination. It would be helpful if the school district was presenting their plans to the council. I think they only did it at the Parks and Rec meeting, I believe. 
I believe. I could be wrong about that. Okay. So um, city manager Murphy, if you want to let Ravenswood know, or if there's some info item or, or some. I'd be, I'd be happy to um, transmit that to the Ravenswood school district. I do just want to caution that um, there in terms of um, presence in front of the full council, it's precious time. So um but um, happy to see if we can fit that in. There may be some um, other other means of uh, working with Ravenswood School District to better improve their uh, survey requests, for example. But we can definitely uh, see if we could fit in a presentation. Okay, thank you. We know agenda management's a big thing. Okay, so speaking of which, um, let's. Um, so we're now up on the dais. I want to first check in with. Um, my colleagues who wanted to pull items for discussion. So Vice Mayor Taylor, I-4 was one that you wanted to discuss about the audit. Thank you. And I'll actually move my comment to K-1. Okay, thank you. Um, so council member, so are you comfortable voting on this item? Thank you. Council member Nash, um, you pulled I-5. So on I-5, um, essentially what I would like to do is shorten the term to um, June 30th, 2024, rather than June 30th, 2026, and ask staff to um, go out for an RF, to issue an RFP to look at um, labor uh, resources, labor legal resources, and then the shortened time frame would be subject to the outcome of the RFP. Yes, we can certainly amend the agreements accordingly and conduct the RFP. Thank you. And so I guess it's a matter of if there's support on council. What was the last part that you said? I'm, I'm dependent on the RFP. So essentially it would, um, the motion would be to approve um, the agreement with a shortened term to June 30th, 2024, rather than the June 30th, 2026. And then outside of, I believe it's outside of the motion, um, staff would be um, going out for an RFP with on this and then coming back. Please feel free to jump in if, I, if there's any different. Okay. Okay. Vice Mayor Taylor. I'm supportive. Um, council member door, council member Combs, any thoughts on revising? Has this been discussed with the, is this, ha, has this agreement coming before us been agreed upon by both parties already? The agreements are on an as needed basis. So it's for the hours that we are requesting them to review an item or prepare an item. Um, and so there's no guaranteed work through that um, proposed agreements um, other than uh, we do have a designated labor representative, um, Charles Sakai, uh, that would be utilized through this agreement. I, I see council member door with her hand raised and then I think council member Combs wants to say something after. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I can be supportive of looking at the how long the agreement currently is. Um, I wonder one does this affect the not to exceed monetary limits that should be placed on it if we are looking at a shorter timeline right now that's 175,000 uh, for Sloan and 100,000 for LCW. And another question, and uh, maybe curiosity back to council member Nash is, uh, or, for, or for the city manager of uh, the kind of RFP process that we would do or need to do and how that might <coughs> um, uh, affect city, city staff time and resources to, to do that additional search. Thank you. If I could maybe jump in on the uh, request for proposal process, that, that generally does take a few months uh, to coordinate depending on the number of 
um, qualified applicants. Uh, we have to review them, then we conduct the interview process. Of course, we'd be working with uh, the city manager's office and city attorney's office um, to review those. Um, and a comment on the, the potential um, term of the agreement ending um, in June 30th, 2024. Just a note that our Police Officers Association contract uh, is up in August 2024. And so that may provide some difficulty in coordinating ahead of those negotiations. Um, but we could certainly move up the request for proposals to accommodate that pending your direction. Uh, Council Member Combs. Um, so when it comes to the relationship with Sloan Sakai, are these firms uh, initially being established with the city? Was that based on an RFP? Uh, let's see, I can, um, we did do a little bit of research about how long ago that might have occurred. And uh, so we, we went back in time to the um, uh, 2020 uh, RFP for legal services and did confirm that that RFP excluded uh, this type of uh, HR labor. And we were not able to locate a RFP prior to that within a multi-year multi standpoint. So that's why we're, we're comfortable that this is appropriate time to conduct such an RFP. So we we did not see um, an RFP for a number of years for the this, these type of services. Yeah, but the, are these on a standard RFP? So like with our current primary counsel, the city attorney, is that there is a certain, because we went out for an RFP because we had a city attorney who stepped down and retired. And so that was the precipitating event to us then going out an RFP. The city had not before that on any regular cadence going out to RFP for legal counsel. Yeah, yes, I agree that, um, that I totally agree with that statement. And then in terms of like the, these other um, uh, uh, legal services um, that the city pursued, we weren't able to come across any other RFPs for these specific discrete legal services. Yeah, so I, that's my concern here and why I would be opposed. One, we don't, we don't have an established tradition of on some regular cadence going out with to RFP re regarding legal services. There's usually some event that happens with regards to the current provider of those legal services that then allows us to go out in RFP. So this creates a, a process that doesn't currently exist with the city and um, as it relates to legal services, um, which seems to be this, 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 this um, event of going out to an RFP without some related event with regards to how those legal services are currently being provided. Um, and then additionally, I think I would be concerned because this is like not the the corpus in some way of the legal services of this whole process we would go through of what we would actually get, what we'd be looking at for all of the, the effort, um, some real like decision um, um, as it relates to, again, like this very sort of kind of siloed and discrete legal services. And yeah, so, so I, I would be opposed. I, I don't, again, like, there is no no current tradition in the city of doing this um, outside of uh, law firms, sort of some event happening in the law firms. And, and I'm, I'm concerned at like, of all of the effort we put into it, I, I don't think uh, we're, we're, we're likely to have an outcome um, where, where, we're, where we really have a, a choice in front of us. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm a little confused about it, to be honest. Um, I'm also, I'm worried about disruption to any kind of ongoing negotiations. Um, so the PSA um, timing um, concerns me. So I don't know if we would extend it to a year and a half or something. Well, I don't know if my colleagues can, uh, provide a little more information is it just that we haven't evaluated this in a long time or um i'm the answer is yes essentially we haven't um and this the discussion has come up in at least for me in closed session 
in the past. And so um, when this came on the agenda, it, and I spoke to the city manager, it seemed like a, a fair time um, to bring it up. That and then also, I mean, this it wouldn't be a surprise, is just thinking about a three-year contract. Um, and then what happens within that three years in our previous negotiation, and I won't say too much about this, um, I was apprehensive about having a three-year contract because if challenges come up and you can't resolve it, you're locked in that contract. And that's not with our attorney services. Well, are we really locked into the contract or is it just that like when providing services under that contract, this is what the, the this is the compensation mechanism that exists, but we can fire them at any time. Um, and so, but, but I will, I, I mean, the extent to which uh, the, the vice mayor, uh, this can be sort of timed in a way that makes her comfortable um, and it's not hitting up against this, then, then I, I, I'm supportive. But then, like I say, that we don't have this as a tradition um, and I would be concerned that we're not gonna get much in the way, but um, I do wanna be responsive to, to concerns that the vice mayor may have. Thank you. So yeah, I think I think I'm aligned with Councilmember Combs. Um, my 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 biggest question too is um, the criteria, the selection. I guess the process for the RFP. It's not like a pavement where you pick the best offer and just make sure they're okay. Um, so I know we had quite an extensive process for selecting our our chief counsel and for some of these big positions. So I just wonder about the timing and the, the effort that would get, be involved. Um, but that being said, if, if it's a matter of just going out for RFP and, and seeing what happens, um, I, just, I just don't want us to get totally sidetracked by this. The goal was to make sure that there there wasn't disruption, but still have the opportunity for possibly uh, fresh eyes. Are you comfortable with um, moving the timing a little bit so it doesn't coincide with negotiations? So the, the timing was specifically so that we could get through these negotiations and not have any um, disruption. Then um, my understanding was that there was an effort to do that um, this calendar year so that it wouldn't be disruptive of the next um, negotiations. But essentially, yes, this is just to try and get a fresh perspective since we haven't had an RFP, um, we don't. and. Um, it, it so uh, it just can I make a recommendation to then ask staff to um I don't do you need to come back because you'll have to come back with a contract or or are we just modifying the contract to make a recommendation on knowing what our sentiment is and not wanting to hit up against labor negotiations when would be a good what would be a good length of terms for this is that So uh, because the agreements, uh, again, are on an, on an as needed basis, I think um, potentially a slightly longer term, maybe to the end of that calendar year might be useful in the instance of negotiations being a prolonged um, event. Sometimes they go very quickly. Sometimes they're an extended process, um, but we can certainly, coordinate the request for proposal. Um, we can start that after this round of negotiations that are active um, with our two associations. Um, we can get a head start on that um, so that it does not interfere with the police officers association negotiations next, next summer. I see council member doors um, hand raised and then I'm seeing our city attorney also. Um, so actually, why don't we jump to the city attorney? Cause when she appears, we should listen to what she says. It wasn't my intention to take your spot council member door. Um, but to the extent it's helpful, I, I agree with, um, your admin services director's, um, recommendation. I think what I'm hearing from the council members, if there's an appetite to go out for, and it, it, it is an RFQ, it's not an RFP, 
um, to go out for an RFQ, that is the the um, expiration date on the contract doesn't need to be the triggering event to go out for the RFQ. So the council may consider honestly just leaving the contracts as is, but directing the city manager to circulate an RFQ by a certain date um, and have that be the triggering event so that if there are no other um, uh, firms or attorneys that apply for this work, you have a contract in place to fall back on and you don't need to bring this contract back. Uh, thank you, City Attorney Doherty. So, um, uh, Council Member Doerr. And thank we can you. wrap this up too, I think. Yes, um, I appreciate what our City Attorney just shared about not changing then the date, but then being able to look into that sometime in the future. Um, so I'd, I'd prefer not changing the date or the uh, amounts at this time. On deciding whether or not to look at the FR, um, RFQ in the future, I have to agree with Council Member Combs about what is our criteria for doing this and uh, how are we directing staff time to work on this versus other things that are, are listed as our city priorities. And so I, I think I do have more questions there and maybe more details would help me assess how well this aligns with our priorities. Um, and also just a general curiosity around how and where can we create criteria for reviewing our RF uh, queues and RFPs that we use as a city. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, did you wanna, or Council Member Nash? So I would much prefer to shorten the date and then amend, extend it if we need to, just come back with an extension. Um, but I believe if there's a three-year contract in place, even though it does have, um, uh, even though we do have the ability to terminate it at any time, um, it seems like it would not, um, I think it would, in, it could inhibit some vendors from applying um, just because it seems like we are not as, it seems like we're more open if we have a termination date, realizing that we may um, amend it and continue it if we, if the, that is what is best in the situation. Um, but if we have a three-year contract, I would think someone may be less likely to um, respond to our RFQ. So with that, um, would you like to make a motion on the consent calendar and whatever language you'd like on that item? I'm thinking we should take this item's vote separately from the full consent calendar. Very well, thanks. So I will Thank go you. ahead and move the consent calendar items minus I-5. So one, two, three, and four. Thank you. A second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Doer to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item I-5. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. And Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you. I would like to um, move I-5 with the change to be a shortened term to 6-30-2024. In other words, the, the contract, um, I actually don't have the, well, to authorize the city manager to execute agreements with Sloan Sakai and Liebert Cassidy Whitmore for legal services related to human resources. And I don't have the rest of the contract, but essentially with a term um, to June 30th, 2024. Uh, Council Member Doerr. Just confirming uh, Council Member Nash that, that that is noting that even, even though that the um, police union is meeting in August, just confirming that that was reflected in, in your decision for, for June 30th. So actually, can we get, um, when is the police bargaining typically happening? 
Police Officers Association MOU expires August 31st, 2024. Uh, we generally start four to five months ahead, um, depending on when the union submits their request to bargain. So, so from my perspective, I, I think that we have to go use the firm as it relates to the, you know, union interactions, we have to use the firm for these cycles that are, that are coming up. Like if we were going to do this, we should have, this is just should have been done months ago while, while there was a lull. But right now, I think it, it would be too much to expect that we're going to switch um, our labor council between the negotiations for the three, there are three main unions or actually, I guess, four, if you consider the, the two um, uh, uh, sworn unions um, and then the two non-sworn unions. And and I feel like you have to get through those the cycle of those negotiations, and then you you start a process of, of a, an RFQ um, because there is an interplay between those negotiations, like, right, um, about, like, sort of what, you know, this group got or, or how the sworn looks versus the non-sworn. Um, so, but again, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be supportive of this, um, but, but I do think it would probably be easier if we just sort of accept that we just are going to go through this, this next count, this next cycle with the current labor council. And, and then after that, you know, in, engage in, in, in a process by which we, we accept like, you know, uh, requests or, or bids from, from possible other labor councils. So I have a, a question, and I'll try to make this this quick. Um, if the goal was to consider fresh eyes before we went into negotiation with the police unions, then what would the date need to be on the contract that we are looking at now? If the um, POA revised successor MOU were to come back to council um, in alignment with the expiration, then that would be August 31st, 2024. Um, the Police Sergeants Association does come up next um, in June 30th, 2025. Um, that's generally linked to the Police Officers Association contract and um, tends to be, a, from my understanding, a, a smoother process to approve that. Um, so maybe if it aligns with the end of the POA negotiations. Um, and, and again, we're certainly able to coordinate an RFQ um, sooner than that, depending on what the council desires. So if I, I mean, to, to some degree, like irrespective of what changes we make to the date on the, this contract, I mean, the council would separately have to give direction on an RFQ process, right? Which you don't have, like you couldn't take that from this, this action item, right? Or, or could you, could, could you use this to get direction on, on an RFQ in a timeline? Yes, we can certainly... Um, coordinate the request for qualifications based on this discussion this evening. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you know, I would say work that out. Like, right, what what's that date that you you want um, the RFQ? And I think the date on the contract becomes kind of irrelevant. It's it, it's sort of working out that that date. Yeah, I'm I'm starting to catch up to where you I think are at. It sounds like if I can reflect back, but I think I'm hearing it. it's taken me a few minutes to get here, is that there's an interest in seeing uh, possible other firms, seeing what's out there, and prior to going into the start of any type of negotiation with the police officers. Because it's too late. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if that's the case, then we need to issue an RFQ like right away. Um, I mean, it sounds like, and invite the current folks to join in that, um, but, or, or not right away, but sooner than later, 
Um, but the, so then to council member Combs point, I mean, if we just extend the contract for the current vendor or current attorney, it's kind of moot because then to, to city attorney Doherty's point, I don't, I can't finish my sentence, but yeah. Um, actually, Administrative Services Director Mello, please. Uh, yes. So, uh, just a point of clarification that the the two agreements before you are for a variety of human re resources related services that are only used on an as needed basis. The City Council's designation of their Chief Labor Negotiator in negotiations. Um, we're drawing upon the firms that we rely upon, but um, that could be um, expanded to other firms, regardless of what happens with um, the two agreements in front of you. So given that information, I I've, I've, am good with whatever people want. <laughs> I can... Let's go to council member door and then let's try to wrap this one up for. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am supportive of going after an RFQ, um, especially if city can confirm that it won't be too, too much work to put that together. Um, I still do question whether or not we need to have a termination date. Um, and maybe as, as a final question back to our city attorney who is, uh, the lawyer in the room of whether or not that makes uh, an RFQ more attractive or um, more attractive for folks who are applying. Um, I'd, I'd love to know that because my sense is maybe it, it doesn't uh, definitely make an RFQ more attractive to know that there is an end term date. And also um, in that way, if, if we still have an ongoing option of continuing a relationship with someone um, in the future, could that relieve us of having to have additional city council conversation about um, deciding to stay with the current or, or, or switch over? I, I will turn to the attorney, please. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that you will receive less. It's not a legal opinion. This is having been in the um, applicant position uh, opinion. I don't think you will receive less applications for Labor and Employment Council by virtue of the fact that you have a contract that is not expired. Um, it might be enticing if there is an expiration, but I don't think it will deter applicants if there is not an impending expiration. Um, and then you had another question, Council Member Doran, I'm sorry. If I'm forgetting about how that might affect, so if we don't have an end term date mm. that's shorter, um, how that'll affect ongoing conversation as a council about this item? Yeah, I mean, one one thing that would, you know, if the council circulates an RFQ, if staff circulates an RFQ and council chooses um, alternative council, um, the city council may want to retain certain services with the two law firms that are before you this evening. Um, and so if there's no expiration, then the city council would not have to like go back and revise those contracts because as Ms. Mello said, it's for it, it's it's on an as needed basis. And so um, there is a opportunity of convenience to have a term that's longer, it doesn't require that the city council utilize um, utilize those firms just because there is a contract in place that says they, they may be used. Thank you. So for that reason, um, and based on that kind of assessment of things, I would be supportive of exploring the RFQ um, and not changing the term date that to give us that a little bit more flexibility. Thank you. All right. Um... Uh, Council Member Nash, can you wrap this up for us? Yes. So um, given that, yes, let's stay with the current contract um, based on the information we just got and go out for an RFQ, please. Thank you. So I make the motion as 
is stated. Thank you. So clarifying that the motion is on the um, contract and then the direction would be a separate direction, not part of the motion. Correct. So, okay. Just, um, so in terms of so staff, is the direction received on the RFQ prior to us making the motion? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So, um, uh, so there's been a motion on the table to kind of approve as written in the staff report um, in the contract. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash and a second by Vice Mayor Taylor to authorize the City Manager to execute an agreement with Sloan Sakai Young and Wong in the amount uh, not to exceed 175,000 and with Liebert Cassidy Whitmore in an amount not to exceed 100,000 for legal service related to human resources, including labor relations, employee relations, staff trainings and workplace investigations over a three year, two month period to align with the end of the fiscal year. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Dower? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Wollison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Fabulous. And um, now we're going to go back to the future because we already did our public hearing, Jay. So we are zooming to our one regular business item. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require City Council approval. The regular business item is K-1, approve fiscal year 23-24 budget principles and review the five-year general fund forecast. And to introduce this item is our Administrative Services Director, Brittany Mello, and our Interim Finance Director, um, Marvin. Uh, please forgive me for blanking on his last name. Marvin Davis, yes. Marvin, Marvin Davis, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, so before you this evening, we have the proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 budget principles and the general fund five-year forecast. We will be reviewing the principles. The purpose of why we're bringing the five-year general fund forecast for you this evening some key economic variables, and the details of the forecast. So here are the three high-level budget principles that the council adopted for fiscal year 2022-2023. They are promote the city's long-term fiscal sustainability, provide city services and infrastructure that contribute to quality of life in Menlo Park, and revenue sources and grant accounting. In the staff report, these principles are fleshed out with sub bullets under each one for the council to modify or approve as proposed. And note that in the um, number three, revenue sources and grant accounting, there is one sub bullet that staff is proposing to remove as it relates to grant administration, uh, which has been uh, resolved in our minds uh, and it's redlined in the staff report for your consideration. And so the general fund forecast is really prepared um, reflecting the adopted budgeting principles, and it's meant to assist the city council with the long term strategic decisions for the city's largest operating fund. The main goal is to provide an outlook for a sustainable general fund over the next five years. The revenue and expenditure assumptions in, that are built into the forecast are based on the best available information with the current financial projections. The model received input from um, both the executive team and multiple expert consultants, as well as the county. Some key economic issues to keep in mind is that our general fund revenues have started to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. Our forecast is based upon those current financial projections, which might change with economic uncertainty. The most revenues have recovered to pre-pandemic levels except for sales tax. And this model um, forecast does remove the utility users tax at this time. In terms of economic uncertainty, some things to keep in mind, um, re inflation remains high. And when um, interest rates are high, it means that there's higher borrowing costs, which can reduce a demand in a variety of ways that trickles down um, economically. There's uncertainty in the regional banking system, and again, recent layoffs in the technology sector. 
And so with those kind of high level items, I would like to hand it over to our interim finance director, Marvin Davis, to review the general fund forecast in greater detail. Marvin. Good evening, uh, Councilman Willison and Vice Mayor Taylor and uh, members of the public and stuff. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so we will review the revenue and expense assumptions. Uh, we will also review the impacts to the reserves uh, for this particular scenario. Our biggest uh, revenue source property taxes, this uh, projection is provided through HDL and it has been resilient and has not uh, diminished with the pandemic. And so it is a strong source. So we're not, uh, our forecast does not diminish that. Our transit occupancy tax has rebounded from the pandemic level. We're estimating it at 10 million and growing at additional 5% throughout the forecast. Our sales tax uh, has not rebounded yet. Uh, the pre-pandemic levels were about 7.5 million and we won't reach that until about the third year in the forecast, then it should be rebounded. License and permits, this is just normal growth associated with the activity. Uh, the other revenues as well, this is uh, other revenues, uh, fines, things like that, and associated with the normal growth. And of course, we have removed UUT uh, from the forecast. Now stop me at any time if you have questions. Uh, the additional revenue, uh, this is uh, one of our big assumptions, our transfer ends. Uh, this is anticipating use of the OPEP trust, a million dollars each year over the forecast. It also anticipates remaining use of the 3.7 million ARPA, which we have to use by the end of December. Uh, and in addition to this, there's uh, transfer ends of 4 million in 2025 is forecasting use of one-time revenues as well as uh, uh, one of the uh, other funds associated with amenities. And so those are the big revenue assumptions. And so uh, let's, we will go to the next slide for the expense assumptions. Mr. Davis, before yes. you move on, um, can you spell out what is OPEP trust disbursement? OPEP, yes, OPEP trust, that is the other post employee benefits. And the trust is the California Employee Retirees Benefit Trust. This is to trust that during the uh, mid-year budget amendments, um, council authorized us to use 1 million during the mid-year in that resolution. And what this forecast is saying is that we would use 1 million per year over the forecast from that trust. Again, these are you know, these assumptions regarding perhaps ways to uh, provide a look at a sustainable general fund, but that's what that trust is. It's the California Employee Retirees Benefit Trust. OPEB is the benefit that it is providing, the other post employee benefit. So this is the trust that's run by uh, California for us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, so we will go to the next slide. Of course, these uh, assumptions are in the attachment A in terms of uh, the details. So the forecast is loaded at the 250 FTE level, which is our current budget level. That's the assumption that it is loaded at full 250. Uh, we do have some placeholders in there for uh, labor negotiations uh, regarding the uh, percentages. This forecast uh, differs from the budget. The budget includes a 5% vacancy factor. This forecast includes a 7.5%. 7.5% uh, equates to 19 FTEs. So this is a, um, somewhat of a, um, a significant assumption, but I think it's a good assumption considering the vacancy factor that we are experiencing. Um, and our forecast for the end of this fiscal year, we are using a 14% vacancy factor. So this is a five-year vacancy factor. We do have CPI inflation for other benefits, uh, capital and operating expenses. And some of those benefits uh, may actually turn out to be more than 3%, but currently this is what we have in the forecast. 
our pension costs uh, actually is trending downward. Uh, we, what that means is that even though the uh, salaries are going up, the current uh, actuarial assumptions in the pension report is trending down about 2% per year. And so um, CalPERS is optimistic regarding uh, the economic conditions over the five years. We're also um, uh, funding the uh, UIL additional payment. This is the 1 million additional payment as part of the budget principles. And it is in the forecast. It's about 962,000, which is rounded up here for 1 million. And so those are our expense assumptions. So this chart here just kind of gives you a depiction of the revenues compared to the expenses. Uh, the year 2022, you see um, an expense that's a little higher. That's That was uh, as a result of the um, 5.2 million that we used for uh, the MPCC electric. The forecast for 2023, uh, we were forecasting about 1.2 million revenues over expenses. And this includes the 14% vacancy rate. That's why you see that. Uh, and then as you can see from 2024 through, there is structural uh, balancing that is required uh, in the general fund. So you can see that there's some structural balancing that is required there. Okay. Okay, so uh, the reserve impacts kind of where everything kind of meets the road here. So over the forecast, you can see the reserves going from about 32.5 down to 24, giving these assumptions under this scenario. Uh, under this scenario, the emergency contingency reserve is maintained. Uh, this is 15% of the DAPI budget. It is maintained. Uh, under this scenario, the economic stabilization reserve is not maintained. It falls short, I think after 2025, it falls short. At the end of the forecast, I think it's around 14 or something like that. And then the, the undersigned fund balance, um, this has to be at a positive uh, level. So we're just indicating that we will keep this at 250,000. And essentially this, this scenario would use the economic stabilization reserves to balance the structural uh, expenses in the general fund. So you would be essentially balancing your general fund from your reserves primarily, you know, for this scenario. And so as you can see there, the emergency reserves are maintained and over the uh, period at the minimum levels, uh, not at the 20% levels, but they're maintained at the minimum levels. And then the uh, next slide shows the uh, economic stabilization reserves. As you can see, under this scenario, it does uh, fall short after 2025. And then uh, as we mentioned that this scenario, if this were a two-year forecast, it'd be fine. <laughs> but you know, it's a five-year forecast. So as a result of that, there would be some structural balancing required after 2025. And so uh, that's um, kind of the, um, that's the presentation. We're looking for approval of the budget principles. We only had one change in the budget principles and that's because we are changing the way we're doing some grant accounting. And so it's cleaning up some grants that were kind of running through uh, the general fund that should be kind of segregated. And then the five-year forecast, uh, that review would be obviously seeking uh, just seeking some understanding in, in terms of those assumptions and your comfort level in terms of the assumptions we're using. And so I can turn it back over to perhaps Stephen or uh, if turn it back over to uh, Brittany. Yes, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Mello and Mr. Davis for the work that went into this. Um, quite sobering. Um, so uh, unless there's any clarifying questions, I think we should jump to public comments. So City Clerk Karen, can you please public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on regular business item K-1, approve fiscal year 2023-24 budget principles, review a five-year general fund forecast, 
please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on regular business item K1. Seeing none, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, so I think um, what we should do first is look at the budget principles. Um, so there is wording in the staff report on pages K 1.1 and 1.2 that outline um, the three high level principles and then sub items. Um, do any council members um, have any comments about any of the principles? Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. And I, I have actually two comments and I did not discuss this with the city manager first. I would probably have better language for it. Um, but what I would like to see in the principles, because I don't see the word that I just love to see, which is equity in a principle as far as how we spend money. Um, I know that there is work being done at the county to look at um, budgeting. Um, I'm not sure it's specifically budgeting principles, but definitely looking at budgeting through an equity lens. And I need to see that in our principles to see. But what does it say? So um, what we're discussing on the dais is 2C has the word equity. Strive to balance the resources and requirements of each area of the city in an equitable manner through the use of equitable tools. So what are the tools? That's the whole thing. We keep saying equity, but there's really no action behind it. Yes. Yeah, so and I've had this problem past five years with budgeting. So um, I guess that's a question for city staff. How are you interpreting this principle in action? And is there a way that we can refine the language to get at an intent? And I guess, Vice Mayor Taylor, it might be up to you to tell us. Well, I'd like to hear from staff first of how they're interpreting it. And then Vice Mayor Taylor, if you can um, let us know how that matches what you're getting at. So these uh, budget principles are the principles that were adopted by the council in the past. And the way that I read to see is um, I'm focusing on each area of the city. So it's about distribution of funds across the city in an equitable manner. So if there's additional language around equity that you'd like to propose um, tonight, um, that would be helpful. And when you say equitable manner, are you saying that um, each district or part of the city gets the same or gets what they need or takes into consideration certain things or how can you? I think it's more complicated than amounts um, in terms of you know equal amounts per district. I, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. I, I, I wouldn't be reading to see that way, um, but uh, obviously open to your feedback. These are your budget principles as the council. So thank you. So if we need to clarify a little more. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to hear from vice mayor Taylor, um, what you think of that. So, um, that that's fair. Um, what the assistant city manager said, um, the document that I am thinking about at the county level has only been shared with you, the assistant city manager and the city manager, not with anyone else on council, because we have yet to discuss it. Um, didn't know how to bring it, but going into the fifth time that I've done budgeting, and this has been a real big problem for me. Um, so I don't have language at the moment, um, but I'm hoping that, um, I don't want to say that doesn't matter, because <laughs> going back to the priorities it would have been helpful if we would have approved equity. So that way it would have been a little bit more concrete in this conversation. Um, but one thing that has been asked for um, over the past couple of years, um, there was a revenue chart um, that was provided that showed how much each district, um, how much revenue from sales tax, from 
TOT and I think property tax and not sure whatever else was on there. The last time it was at, done was in 2019. Um, so that was the other item that I was going to bring up um, on the earlier um, receive and file the budget. So those are my two items. So in terms of action, in terms of editing this document tonight, um, where where are you in that? So I think it would be unfair if all of the council members doesn't have the same information that I have. So I'm not sure it can happen this evening. I can um, do my best if anyone else has anything else to add and I can look at the other document and maybe provide some edits. Um, are there other, or City Manager Murphy, do you have thoughts on? Uh, let's see, I can just say that uh, even going back to last year, there were edits regarding uh, budget principles and you know the, the it's a budget process that we're going through. So if there's um, uh, some feedback this evening, that the important thing is just being clear about the the topic area, the focus of, of some potential edits. Um, but I'll say that some of this will come through with the actual uh, budget preparation. So the um, county through the um, um, county's office of equities going through a series of quarterly meetings, they've uh, prepared a, a toolkit that can be uh, shared and that could be a, a potential guide for us. Um, Moving forward, uh, again with this particular budget cycle, we're we're, we're at a, a pretty tight tight time frame, but we can see what we can integrate in this particular cycle. Um, so I'm I'm kind of focused on the um, budget principle aspect. There was the other uh, comment about, from Vice Mayor Taylor about some of the revenue uh, and we have made uh, progress on updating that. So that should be something that's shareable with the uh, council and the community in the next month or so. So I think it would be helpful, City Manager Murphy, if you could share out the document that Vice Mayor Taylor is referencing. And then it doesn't sound like um, there may be another opportunity prior to the budget creation to revisit these words and edits. But if we can all have an opportunity to digest the sentiment there will obviously this is just kind of high level and then we're going to be seeing numbers so there'll be that can help influence what we're thinking um vice mayor taylor is that satisfactory at this stage or at this point it's it's a beginning um so it's it's helpful and i think it's important um for you all to to see the the document Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. And, and, and thank you, um, City Manager Murphy, for the update about the revenue document. Uh, Council Member Dorr. Thank you. Um, I do have a small requested adjustment that I'd like to propose for 2B. 2B says, proactively maintain and improve existing infrastructure to minimize maintenance costs and decrease the city's greenhouse gas emissions. I'd like to make that a maintenance costs, comma, greenhouse gases, comma, uh, increase long-term disaster and climate resilience is something I'd like to see there too. Um, reflective of our, our city priority of, of climate action, including adaptation, and wanting to see that better reflected here in the principles, as well as other emergency preparedness that are also a city priority. So um, can I see if I'm supportive of that. I'm seeing thumbs up on the dais. So um, well, anything else, Council Member Dorr? It looks like you have support for that edit. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Nash, any edits to the document? So I don't have any edits um, to the principles itself. I have one comment um, slash request about reserve policies. Is this a good time to bring it up or? Um, is that more related to the five-year forecast? Actually, it certainly is. Okay, yes. so, so I'll wait. Let's wait on that. Council Member Combs. Okay, I have um, one edit and one comment, which may lead to an edit. Um, I was thinking on about when we're talking about quality of life in section two. Um, 
A, implement ordinances and city council adopted initiatives and strategies to contribute to the quality of life in Menlo Park now and in the future. Because um, I see us doing some things that might not help someone today, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Do I have support for that edit? Okay. Okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, consensus for that. Thank you. And then um, on one C, strive to achieve city council cost recovery goals for all fee-based services. I'm bringing this up because in our recent conversations about MPCC, we were talking about waiving a lot of fees and there seems to be a little bit of tension between some of the direction we were giving in that area and this budget principle. And I just wanted to know if anyone else saw that too and had any ideas on how, or if staff has any thoughts on that or how to resolve that. I will mention on the proposed budget calendar that an update to the master fee schedule um, is proposed for August 15th council meeting. Um, when that fee schedule is brought back to the council, that is another opportunity for you to determine the level of um, subsidy um, for the different items. So that could guide us after the budget development process. I might feel more comfortable then instead of it saying, all fee-based services, if it just said um, cost recovery goals for fee-based services, because I feel like right now it's written as an absolute, and it sounds like there might be a little more nuance and discretion. I mean, of course, as we go through the budget and we see we don't have the money to waive everything, um, so that seems to be more where we're tracking on this. Um, so are my colleagues comfortable? I see a thumbs up from Councilmember Combs, a nod. Okay. So let's remove the word all from 1C to just reconcile with kind of some of the conversations we've been having. Um, okay, any other comments or can we move on from the budget principles? Okay, so let's now move on to the five-year forecast and looking at the agenda, we're just reviewing it. So this is just our opportunity to ask questions, make comments, we're not adopting this or anything. So Council Member Nash, you mentioned something about reserve. So it just seems um, given where we are with the reserve policies that it would be um, prudent to take a look at the, our current reserve policies, possibly amend them. And that um, to do that, it would be interesting for staff to look at other cities and best practices and um, return with a recommendation as to whether or not we should be re amending the reserve policies based on the research if warranted. Thank we can you. certainly conduct that research. It is a creative way to handle our, <laughs> um, but I think that makes sense to take a look at it at this point. And the reason um, Menlo Park, I believe, um, has exceptionally um, strong reserves um, in our, po our policy is, is higher than many, I believe. And so that's, it's really to not to just try and make our policies match where we are, but it's really to see where should they be. I appreciate that council member Nash. Um, and actually, I guess a follow-up question would be what consequences, if any, would result in lowering our reserves? Cause I, I don't know if we get bonds or, or ratings or, or things like, oh, okay. That's the whole point of looking at it. Okay. So both looking at best practices and consequences. Thank you. Um, anything else, Council Member Nash, about the five year forecast? Okay. Uh, Council Member Combs, no comments. Um, Council Member Taylor, any comments about the five year forecast? Uh, sorry, Vice Mayor Taylor. Oh. No, thank you. I didn't know if you weren't responding because I got the wrong title. <laughs> thank you. Um, Council Member Dorr. Um, just a reflection that given the general fund economic stabilization reserve, I'm especially excited to explore how we can um, increase city revenue and address expenses to make um, to make that uh, better for us as a city moving forward. Um, I'm looking at the graph on page K 1.7. Um, so excited to continue exploring that together as a city. Thank you.
uh, just catching up on which which graph are you looking at? The purple graph that says the economic stabilization oh, reserve. Right. Okay, that's thank being you. drawn down. Okay, thank you, thank you Council Member um, Door. Yeah, I just um, I appreciate having the opportunity to review this. Um, I think you know you don't want to be on the council that spent all the money and didn't have enough to cover it. So I think we're going to have to have some conversations going forward. This is just a helpful data point. Um, a lot of this is built on assumptions. Um, so um, I think we have to remember that, um, but it's good for us to have a kind of a sober look at where we're at moving forward. So I appreciate the work that went into this. Um, in terms of the assumptions, just looking through. So if I heard right, the vacancy factor that is being used for the forecast is 7.5. This year, it's 14%. Is that right? That's our projected current vacancy rate for the and end of this fiscal year. And what's been our historical average or our typical vacancy rate? Do you know? I don't, I do not know that off the top of my head. Marvin, are you still available? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, uh, this last year, uh, this recent, uh, as of December, we had a vacancy rate of 24% as of the end of December. And now we're forecasting the vacancy rate of 14% for this last six months. And so, the city's always had a vacancy of at least 10% in a couple of years I look back. It's never had a full um, full staffing level. So I, I'm not afraid of that 7.5 in the model. It's I think it's reasonable. I okay. definitely do. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And um, just to remind us that while it's great for our finances to have the vacancy rate for us that want things to get done and residents that want all kinds of services, it, it, it does hinder us. Um, I also wanna point out I, when I was saying, I don't wanna be the council that spent all the money, um, that the discrepancy really between our revenues and our expenses is um, in large part because of the loss of a revenue source in this forecast of the UUT and um, the payment of the refunds. So I just wanted to highlight that um, as a big hit. And so, that is something I'd like to um, consider going forward in terms of um, revenue, potential conversations around a stream of revenue, an ongoing stream of revenue, because that's really what we're losing um, in this forecast is a reliable um, stream. And so if there's other opportunities, um, creative opportunities to make that up, um, um, I'd be open to hearing what those are. Um, anything else from the council? Okay. Um, then I believe I can go ahead and make the motion. Uh, Ms. Mello, was there anything else you needed? No, thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve the fiscal year 23-24 budget principles um, and that we reviewed the five-year forecast if that's needed in there. Uh, with the um, edits that were discussed and had consensus on the dais, please. Okay, Council Member Nash seconded. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to approve the budget principles with edits as presented for fiscal year 2023-24 and the review of the five-year general forecast. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member Combs? Yes. City council member Dower? Yes. City council member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. And City Manager Murphy, can you confirm that the direction around the emailing out of the equity document and the update for the revenues and expenses by district uh, is received by staff. Yes, both of those uh, bits of direction and also the direction on uh, uh, researching the 
revenue, the reserve policy and uh, exploring um, potential revenue options. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. So we are moving on to our finale items, um, but I believe we need to extend the meeting for a few minutes. Um, so City Clerk Karen, do we need to do something about that? Yes, thank you so much, Mayor Willison. Um, so by acclamation, we will need to extend the meeting beyond 11 p.m. So as long as we have a consensus, nodding, nodding. Yes. Councilmember Doer has her hand raised. Councilmember. Yeah, hi. I, I've got a splitting headache and body oh aches and a cough and a fever. I, I need to call it a night to take thank care of myself. So Councilmember. So I'm going to go and uh, thank you all. Thank you for the conversation. Yeah. And I will send uh, some updates for the city council to uh, the city clerk in case you're able to share that uh, okay. live. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Dorr. Okay, we wish her well and a good night's sleep. Um, okay, so we, like I said, are moving on to overtime here on our final items, which are our informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Heron, do we have any public comment on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of our informational items, L1, City Council Agenda Topics, L2, Transmittal of City Attorney Billing, or L3, Update on the City's uh, Housing Element Update, uh, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. For anyone in person, you may complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. Final call for public comment on our informational items L1 through L3. Seeing none, Mayor Wilson, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, so are there any questions or comments about the informational items for City Council? Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. So I have a question about L3, and it's be mainly because of the, the time and the fact is we still have a closed session. Um, the update on the housing element, there was some direction that I had. Um, does it have to be done this evening? Um, I guess that's the question for the city manager. I believe the city manager might need that repeated to him. I, I was, th thank you, Mayor. I was in this instance able to multitask a little bit. So, I, if if the what Vice Mayor was saying was that uh, she had some potential direction and wa wanted to know whether it needed to be identified tonight or not, uh, I would say, for the most part, the answer would be yes. Um, at least to identify what what the topic is, and then we can kind of identify from there later. But I, I'd at least need to know what the topic is. There's a chance that it could be something that comes later, but without knowing what it is, I, I, I need to err on the side of saying yes, because everything's extremely time sensitive related to the housing element. Thank you. Um, a, a question I have is um, the status of the, the BMR um, RFP. If, if we've had any applicants, is that, uh, is that time closed? Ruth Bear, hi, good evening. I can help address that question. Deanna Chow, Assistant Community Development Director. So we did issue an RFP for a uh, BMR administrator. The uh, period has closed. We are reviewing uh, the receipt of one, um, of one submittal. Thank you. Um, my, my other, well, my, my request is actually that um, that the BMR policy come back to the council um, sometime, I mean, as quickly as possible, um, just to make some recommendations and some updates that can potentially, um, I, I think, um, have a positive impact on um, displacement in Menlo Park. So just thinking about um, the housing element and um, 
the city doing a, a little bit more. Um, and so with our existing tools, and I think that the, the BMR policy is one of them. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. The review of the BMR guidelines is identified as one of the housing element programs in the housing element. I can look that up, I, um, but there are certainly a number of competing programs that are, are um, in our in our documents. So if that is something that the city council would like to move up, we can certainly look at that. I know the anti-displacement strategy was one of the items that was identified as a priority. So um, I believe that is, um, potentially sooner than the BMR review. Thank you. I think that there, there, there's some of the language in our BMR policy that is actually not, I wanna, I wanna use the word not helpful. Um, it's essentially, I think there's more that we can do um, with our existing policy. And I don't know if the city attorney, I've actually talked to our city attorney about it. Um, it is late and I am not articulating myself very well, but there are some places in our BMR policy um, where we can improve it um, that would impact people now. So for instance, I don't know if, if you all know that the BMR unit it runs anywhere from $2,900 to $3,500 a month. Um, the average person that it's intended for um, can't rent it because it's too expensive. Um, is there something in our formula that we can change, or if the AMI at the state level, if we can adopt the county level AMI, like there's something that we can use within our tool house to make of these units um, that are not affordable, more affordable. And I'm not sure exactly what it is. And it's, if I had the discussion with the city attorney about it. Um, so I'm looking at that. What, what do we have that's existing that we can make a few tweaks um, and hopefully um, keep, either keep people housed or, or be able to offer um, more affordable housing. So that's my intention with the BMR. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, did I already ask you two if you had comments on the housing? Okay, um, the only thing I wanted to say about the housing element uh, really was for the public's benefit and looking at the timing. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done this calendar year. I guess all of the work needs to be done this calendar year. And because of that, um, some of the community meetings or council meetings um, might be taking place during the summertime, which is when a lot of people um, tend to have their kids out of school and travel. So city manager Murphy, can you just speak to that for a moment? Uh, yes, the... Um... What's outlined in the uh, attachment is a number of um, number of potential meetings in the summertime. Um, in time times past, the city does its best to uh, avoid uh, certain meetings in, in the summertime, and this is a case where we don't necessarily have that uh, luxury. So we are going to uh, do our best to identify. Uh, let's see, to, to reflect a couple of things. One is to the, the city council has a um, identified a, um, uh, a certain uh, meeting schedule this summer that we're looking to uh, respect. Uh, we'll know better in the next week or so if we're able, able to do that. I will also be looking to identify more specific uh, dates or weeks or time frames for some of these meetings and try to get the actual calendar scheduled so that uh, people can plan uh, accordingly. We'll try to make sure that people are aware of the various topics to be discussed, what things that may be of greatest interest to them. Majority of the meetings that we'll be pursuing will most likely have some sort of hybrid component. Um, so even though uh, hopefully people could be enjoying their um, well-deserved vacations or breaks that uh, they could also uh, tune in if desired or if need be the, some of the meetings would be um, videotape for future viewing, things like that. But there's, uh, given the overall time frame that we're working within, it's, uh, it is important for us to continue doing uh, work over the summer. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. And um, as we've discussed, just the more communication that the city can do about when those meetings are and kind of highlighting, you know, summertime might mean beaches and vacations, but the city doesn't sleep. And so kind of keep, keep your eyes out. Um, would be great. Okay. Um, so Councilmember Nash. 
Just very quickly, I want to thank staff for all the work that you're doing and realizing that coming forward, we're now going to be working um, during the summer. We, especially you, are going to be working during the summer and with the vacancy rate we have that puts more work on everyone and just thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nash, and thank you, staff. Okay, so with that, um, we're on to L City Manager's report. So back to you, City Manager Murphy. Uh, yes, it is uh, is late. Uh, we do have an uh, important closed session to be able to uh, conduct this evening. So the uh, one thing I would like to um, mention this evening and uh, then follow up on is related to uh, Middlefield Road, um, a stretch that it has uh, recently been uh, repaved as uh, Cal Water has completed its um, water main replacement. Uh, we're focused in on the um, area roughly between uh, Survey Lane, Seminary Drive, and Santa Monica. So pretty much the stretch that uh, does not have any existing concrete medians. The area is not near signalized intersections. Uh, we, we believe that there's this opportunity to um, pursue a, a pilot which would um, uh, um, maintain the overall uh, volume, uh, traffic volume capacity on that stretch of roadway and improve um, uh, safety, particularly for uh, pedestrians and, and left turning vehicles and for the overall um, mobile public. And so that would involve converting, uh, going from two lanes in each direction to one through lane in each direction and then a center turn lane. So that center turn lane is the opportunity to help provide more predictability for um, travelers in as they traverse that corridor without um, adverse impacts elsewhere. But we were, are looking to pursue a, a pilot um, that would uh, commence uh, shortly. I am, uh, have communicated out to the uh, council through a one-way communication, and then I'm uh, announcing it this evening. So it's our, our intent to be able to um, seize this opportunity to conduct a pilot on this stretch to help plan for uh, overall um, uh, analysis on the Middlefield corridor in the com coming years. So uh, we'll be pushing out more information regarding this in the in the days to come. So I just wanted to be able to kind of uh, share that this evening. Again, it is a little bit late. We'll follow up with the, the specifics, but um, feel like this is the proper time to uh, pursue this pilot. Is that your full update? Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you, City Manager Murphy, for looking at uh, opportunity to improve safety there. I live right there and I feel very exposed when I try to cross Middlefield at that stretch. Um, and I, yeah, I, I look forward to that pilot. Um, are there city council member reports? Council member Combs? Yeah, I do. I, I wanted to, um, cause it wasn't able to in our last meeting, um, acknowledge that uh, earlier the month in, in, in this month, the city's uh, annual egg hunt returned um, and it returned uh, to, to, to Flood Park. Um, and hats off to uh, everyone in the city, um, um, staff and, and the county that was involved. I, I think it was um, overall uh, an incredibly successful event, very, very well attended. I ran into some friends who had gone to the egg hunt for a neighboring city that we will not name and they actually didn't do egg hunts they like had you count the number of eggs in a basket or something it was um according to her not nearly as fun as the menlo park um event so again hats off i do want to though um acknowledge that um it was an incredibly popular event and and um you know uh, parking uh took over uh neighboring streets and and when I left, there was actually cars parked on both sides of Bay Road. And there is no parking allowed on Bay Road at all. But there was just a stream of, of cars parked. And so I only offer that to like, you, you know, one of the things that, that has come up is as the county has, um, you know, moved further along in their, their plans to renovate, vitalize, uh, make greater usage of, of the park. 
one of the things that has come up is neighborhood concerns about those traffic impacts, um, of which um, I, I think that the county hasn't been really responsive to. And hopefully, I know um, all events there, um, when it is fully renovated, won't be like this. But I, I do think we should take this as an opportunity to, to be sort of aware of some of these concerns that have come from, from neighbors about, like, again, the park being utilized um, a greater degree in the future, which we're all um, excited about, but that, that like, we, we understand exactly what those, those impacts are. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Council Member Nash? So just a real quick update, um, the Stanford Community, Community Resources Group met and we talked about environment, transportation, housing, taxes, and services. Most of the effort or most of the focus is on Santa Clara County, but there is some focus on San Mateo County. And hopefully Stanford will be coming back with some information actually about um, San Mateo County and some of those um, hot topics. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Um, one shoreline met yesterday, um, and the hot topic is their planning guidance policy to protect and enhance bay shoreline areas in San Mateo County. Um, there is a public draft that I will send to the city clerk um, so that it becomes a part of the attachment. Um, I also had a CCAG meeting. Let's see, don't remember the date, but had a CCAG meeting this month. Um, I believe it was on the 12th. Um, and a couple of topics that came up there. Um, one is their um, equity equity committee um, and also the commute.org. Um, commute.org is actually, a, well, actually combining, I believe it is three routes to one um, because of low ridership. Um, there is a, also an attachment um, that um, that explains that and also, there will be an attachment that talks about some upcoming funding through the Department of Transportation. Um, and then lastly, um, we had an MPCC um, working group meeting last week. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Um, City Clerk Karen, did um, Council Member Dorr have some comments for you to share? Yes, I do have a City Council Member Dorr's report out. First, she would like to thank all the youth who helped organize and volunteer. Um, the day of the Earth Day Festi Festival, um, it was such a success. Lots of high school students were involved, including Katie, Ashani, Danielle, Mia, Angelina, Taylor, Maya, and Seema, among many, many others. Also, City Council Member Dorr will not post office hours next week on Tuesday, May 2nd. Uh, you can join her at the Woodside Bakery in Sharon Heights the following week on Tuesday, May 9th. Uh, the Heart Annual Meeting, uh, she attended the meeting on Tuesday, April 18th. There are resources that Menlo Park residents can apply for that were discussed to increase housing affordability. There's a Quick Start program provides short-term five-year loans for housing developers, school districts, and faith-based groups. And a first-time homebuyer program, which provides up to 15% down payment so people just pay 5% if there's a 20% down payment, if you are income qualified. And last is the FOSCA uh, meeting, attended the board policy committee on Wednesday, April 12th. The committee is a small special group that sets the agenda for BOSCA and BOSCA is the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Fun fact, uh, potable water use is down 24% from February of 2013, thanks to improved efficiency. Uh, and at that meeting, City Council Member Dorr supported recommendation to not increase water rates to protect water rate payers for a 0% increase and led a recommendation to start tracking board demographics and find ways to improve agency access for the public. Fun fact, 26 board of directors represent 1.8 million water users in the Bay. And that concludes City Council Member Dorr's report. Thank you for all of those fun facts. Um, I will report out that um, I was at commute.org um, and they were just highlighting 
Um, there's like a commuter challenge. Um, so if you're a commuter, you can register with commute.org and earn prizes and things like that. Um, bike to wherever month is coming up, especially May 18th, 19th, and 20th, where you can go to energizer stations and get bags. There's a friendly competition going on amongst the cities um, in San Mateo County to see how many residents in each city are pledging to ride during um, bike to wherever month and Menlo Park is in the lead. So I encourage my colleagues and all residents to pledge and get others to pledge so we can shame everybody else um, in a really friendly, um, civil way. And um, uh, Council Vice Mayor Taylor and I this week attended the San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce Progress Seminar, along with many, many other elected officials and community partners. Um, and it was quite the event to discuss local issues with many people in our area. Um, so lots of connections made, lots of networking, lots of standing. Um, and, um, I think that's about it for now. So with that, um, unless anyone else has anything burning at 1119, oh, I'm kidding. Um, we promised we were going to call for public comment on the closed session item one more time. So I remembered, and we are now moving on to public comment. City clerk, Karen, is there any more public comment for O1, our closed session item? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide public comment on our closed session item 01, which is a conference with labor negotiators, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item 01. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So the City Council will be adjourning this regular meeting and reconvening in closed session. And the closed session report out, if any, will occur at the May 9th City Council meeting. So with that, I'm adjourning us to closed session at 1120.